Okay, folks, it is 6.30, so I will call our meeting to order. State about showers and emergency money. Okay, hello everybody. Just a moment ago, I saw the, uh, the new page that had all the dire directions about uh, participating remotely, but I will mention briefly uh, anyone who's joining remotely, please indicate your uh, name, your first and last name on, on your screen. Anyone who wishes to speak, either in person or remotely, please raise your hand. Or uh, if you're on remote, raise your electronic hand on your, uh, on your Zoom machine. Uh, we'd ask you to keep all your comments to three minutes, and we will have... Uh, assistance of <clears throat> Ms. Prim if uh, with uh, keeping track of time. And uh, I think that's about it. We have a couple of members of the council who are uh, appearing remotely, so I'll ask them to identify themselves. This is Carrie Brown, District 3. Hi, everyone. Penny Cohn, District 2. OK, thank you. Um, we have uh, next up is to approve the agenda. We have a couple of uh, changes, at least from the printed agenda. We had uh, item number six, presentation by downtown businesses. Um, they're uh, not able to be here, so we'll be rescheduling them for another night. And I think that's it for changes to the agenda that I'm aware of. Presentation beginning right after the consent agenda. Uh-huh, yep. And uh, we're, next up, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity. We haven't got there. We will when we get there. <laughs> we, <clears throat> I'll consider the agenda approved. The time is for general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public uh, to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. And as with other items, we uh, ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. We'll start by seeing if there's anyone on the in the room who is interested in addressing the council. The only one, but I walked around town with folks who've lived here for years, and they feel like it's not worth their time. It's it's useless to address the council and try to change anything. And that's a systemic problem you all need to deal with. Um, no one noticed for- We just start by- Thank you. No one noticed for 10 or 11 months uh, since the flood that the Wi-Fi wasn't working in front of city hall. And I looked into it, found the unplugged cable in the basement realize that the existing cable will reach easily into the upstairs window. The device is mounted directly between the downstairs and upstairs windows outside of John's window, city clerk's office. And it was simple a matter of having your IT consultant assign it to a jack and remake the ethernet end because it's too large to pull through the existing hole. Um, I went through it with John. He thought finance killed it. I asked Lumbra. He thought it's like, what does it take to get something working that people rely on? It, I, I hadn't noticed it because I pre frequently use Aubuchons, but it was a, somebody from New South Wales, Australia, who said, "Where's the public Wi-Fi? We need it. You know, we're tourists here, you know." So if we want to be an inviting town and begin to pretend that we've or recovering, uh, let's get simple stuff done, like get the Wi-Fi turned back on. Not only in City Hall, at City Hall and out front, but let's plan it for all around town. We have district heat. It has fibers on top of it. It is untrue that those fibers could not be used without creating a security risk by designating a fiber for district heat metering of hot water and using other fibers it was a gross oversight in the district heat system going in to not have buried fiber beneath it and have 100 fibers available. But there are eight fibers, and they go to most of the areas in town where we would want to put Wi-Fi access points. And 
we could potentially even generate revenue. If an ISP wants to get into a particular building that's served by district heat, that may be a way to generate that may be the cheapest way to get them into the building. Again, no security risk, no light travels between parallel fibers. They're totally different, physically isolated circuits, even though they're close together. Um, the last meeting, you approved a $100,000 contract without a comp competing bid for just moving the fiber above flood level. One without a reference to what, or even a design First, it, it's a waste of public funds to spend money that way. That's a huge amount of money for the amount of fiber that needs to get moved. And we should start with a plan for how, what else might it get used for? How might it generate revenue? I would ask that you reconsider the vote on approving a no, no competition, $100,000 contract for moving the fiber and put that one on pause while we get our design together consistent with a Wi-Fi plan. Uh, a walkway across the tracks, the construction on the railroad track between Shaw's and our 16 main parcel, the, where the M&M used to be, it has been a real hazard. They removed a whole lot, they cut the asphalt, they've created huge deep obstacles of people having to cross. That is traditional walkway from M&M to Shaw's. It's hazardous to go to the sidewalk and walk in through the parking lot because there's no sidewalk there and you got blind backing out traffic out of those spaces along the rail. So it's going to be, and then I just heard that ECI from ECI that they're planning, they think that they're supposed to put a chain link fence all along there when this bridge construction is done. That should not. Thank you. Your time is expired. And you don't think any of this is worth discussing, right? What I know is that uh, the city council discuss, city manager discusses every item that comes to general business and appearances the day after the, our meetings. And where's the follow-up to the public who bothered to bring it to your attention? So thank you, Steve. Is there anyone else in the room uh, wishing to be heard on general business and appearances? And is there anyone online? I'm not seeing any hands, but it can be tricky to, to tell. Okay, not seeing anyone. Thank you. Um, mm, sorry? Yeah. Okay, next up we have the consent agenda. We are uh, pulling two items off the consent agenda. Item D, resolution to honor retiring Chief Gowans and Stevens and Associates contract amendment. And of um, course, there are no minutes to approve. Okay. So the so what's on the consent agenda is payroll and warrant approval and liquor licenses. Is there a motion to approve uh, the consent agenda with those two items on it? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you. Now, to bring up the resolution in honor of retiring Fire Chief Gowans. Bob, why don't you come on up? This is, this is probably your favorite thing, right? Having a lot of people pay attention to you. Uh, okay, folks, every, shall I read it? I'll, I'll read it. This is uh, for, a, for a vote. Resolution honoring the retirement of Fire Chief Robert Gowans. Whereas the city of Montpelier takes great pride in recognizing the dedication and service of its distinguished citizens, and whereas Robert Gowans has faithfully and honorably served the Montpelier Fire Department for over four decades, beginning his illustrious career on July 12, 1979, and whereas through his unwavering commitment and un exemplary service, Robert Gowans was promoted to lieutenant in 1996, further elevated to deputy chief in 2008, and ultimately achieved the rank of fire chief on May 1, 2011, and whereas Robert Gowans is a proud graduate of Montpelier High School and has served his country with honor in the United States Navy. And whereas as an active member of New England Association of Fire Chiefs, Robert Gowans has contributed significantly to the professional development and standards of fire services across the region, 
And where, whereas Fire Chief Robert Gowans was instrumental in implementing the paramedic program into the Montpelier Fire Department, greatly enhancing the emergency medical services available to our community. And whereas beyond his duties in the fire department, Robert Gowans has served as the town service officer and health officer, demonstrating his dedication to the welfare and safety of Montpelier's residents. And whereas his career is marked by the saving of countless lives and his support of numerous community events, including the Do Good Fest and the Vermont Mountaineers baseball team, further exemplifying his commitment to community engagement and service. And whereas Robert Gowan's leadership, compassion, and tireless dedication have left an indelible mark on the city of Montpelier and its citizens. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city of Montpelier hereby honors and expresses its deepest gratitude to Fire Chief Robert Gowans for his extraordinary service, leadership, and dedication to the safety and well-being of our community, and be it further resolved that the Montpelier, city of Montpelier extends its best wishes to Robert Gowans for a fulfilling and well-deserved retirement with profound appreciation for his contributions to the city. Is there a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. And is there a second? Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you on behalf of the city and Thank you, Phil. Up. We also have the key to the city of Montpelier. Thank you. And we have a resolution, but we're going to give it to you when the Alzheimer's, Terry and Taylor. Yes. Okay. Get that ready. You're not done yet, Bob. So I, I got a few things to say. <laughs> and then I know there's some others. So I have worked with Bob for almost 30 years and the last 12 or so as chief, and it has been my privilege to work with him through uh, floods and ice and walk around rivers in the freezing cold and everything else that we've done all this time. Um, and I just want to say thank you for your service. But most of all, our whole I, I believe I speak for our whole team and we have a card here. And we have a photo of most of the fire department. And because um, you were such an important part of the leadership team, and I know you enjoyed it, we have a photo oh, of thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. No, I'll just... <laughs> so I just want to thank all of you. Um, I'll start with and introduce my wife, Angela. Um, some of you know her. She served on the council a number of years ago. But um, And then I also want to um, recognize on the screen, I have so many family members up there, so many friends, so many friends that I didn't know were going to be on this call. Um, it's hard. To, I'm trying to find everybody, <laughs> and I can't. Um, but for everybody who was there, thank you so much for this. Um, just trying to see everybody is, you know, family, friends, uh, the Fort Lauderdale, uh, police chief is on the call. <laughs> so that's where my, my son ret I retired as a Fort Lauderdale police officer. He's here, a friend of Angela's and mine. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for everything. Um, and there may even be a couple of grandkids that want to say something. <laughs> Evelyn's going to let him in. So, yeah, just use the your hand raise and, and Evelyn will let you in one at a time. Okay. Well, thank you, Bob. Yes. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm seeing the hands raised and I'm getting ready to call on people. Um, the first up is Sarah Gowans. You want to say, say it? Oh, it's not just Sarah. Yeah. 
shot. Can you say it louder, Grandpa? Say it. Can you say it louder? I love you, Grandpa. And what do you I love you too, Gavin. It's my grandson, Gavin. And Sophia's there, my granddaughter, Sophia, my son, Dan, and his wife, Sarah. Hi, Grandpa. Hi. I love you. I love you too. I'll see you in August. You want to talk? I'd like to talk at the end, Dad, if I can, if you want to go to other people. Okay. Sure. Uh, quickly. <laughs> These folks have business to do here tonight. Uh, Dylan, you're up next. Just wanted to congratulate congratulate my stepdad and Bryce. You'll see Happy retirement, time. Grandpa. Thank you. Yeah. Bryce is our grandson that's living with us this summer. So, nice. yep. Yeah. And next, M. Gowans. Hey, Bob. It's uh, I'm Bob's youngest sibling, and uh, I just can't. Uh, we can't be more proud of you. What wasn't mentioned in the uh, this beginning speech was not only has Bob been a leader for the city of Montpelier, but he's also been a leader for all of his four siblings, his grandchildren, all the way down through the line. We are so proud of you, Bob. We love you and uh, hope for nothing but greatness in the future with you, for, for you. I love you, buddy. Thank you, man. <laughs> Congrats. Thank you. All right. Do we have anyone in the room who's yeah. looking to I think speak? That's everybody on. I think that's everyone online. Yeah. Oh, Dan, why don't you, Dan, you wanted to speak. Why don't you speak up now? Uh, yeah. First of all, Dad, I sorry I'm not there. Um, <clears throat> you know, you've uh, you've been a true leader to not just the city. But the family, uh, your character, uh, <clears throat> at the end of the day, we're, we're nothing without character. And uh, I can honestly say that my career was because I walked in your footsteps. And the person I am is because I walk in your footsteps. And it's easy to be a leader 40 hours a week, but you are truly a leader 24 seven. The, the things I've seen you do for your community, you know, I, I've seen you go back to fire scenes on your day off and pull furniture out and bring it to the house and clean it. Uh, I've, I've seen you help people in need. You know, that city's gone through some pretty traumatic incidents and I, you know what I'm talking about? And you didn't only support your guys, but you lifted that city up and you lifted the family up. So at the end of the day, all we have is our character. And when you walk out that door, <clears throat> just know that your character will supersede your career. It'll supersede 40 hours a week. And that right there, you should be proud of. And I love you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. I love you too. Um, we'll you be know. seeing you soon, and um, appreciate everything. Okay. And you and Sarah have on department shirts. Yeah, oh, nice. <laughs> you got on some department T-shirts. So great. So this, it, I see Rachel Crow. Your daughter Rachel is on. Okay. So Rachel, you should be unmuted now. Congratulations. Hey, Cooper, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Just Cooper's wanted nice. to just wanted to say congratulations and very proud of your career and everything that you've done. Um, you know, Dan, Dan said it um, beautifully. And, you know, I just appreciate everything that you've done for all of us and you know, pushing me to, to do better and be a better person. So um, I'll keep it short, <laughs> but um, we love you and congratulations. Thank you, Rachel. And I'll see you next week or next Saturday. Next Saturday, you 
Rachel flies next Saturday. Yeah. So just so everyone knows, um, my son Dan is a retired uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida police officer, and my daughter Rachel is retired from the United States Coast Guard. Uh, a Norwich grad. She's a Norwich grad, and a and I uh, retired. She retired from the Coast Guard. Just and actually. Uh, Rachel and I retired on the exact same day, just one year apart. Yeah. We both retired on June 24th, a year apart. So Notice they both beat you. What's that? <laughs> Notice they both beat you. They both beat me. I have no <laughs> idea why. So, <laughs> Yeah. And uh, if it wasn't for Angela, I'd probably still, I wouldn't be here tonight. I'd still be working. So <laughs> yeah. uh, the only reason I'm retired is because of Angel told me I had to, so, because uh, it was like, it was about a year and a half ago, I, I went to Bill and I said, I think I'm going to retire. And then I ended up staying another whole year. And the reason I stayed is because of this fantastic team we have here. That's the reason I stayed. I just, I loved working with this team with Bill and Kelly and Sarah and Evelyn and Chris and the entire team, Eric and um, Kevin. And if it wasn't for all of them, Kurt, I know there's others that aren't here. For, um, I, I would have left a year ago, but because of the great team we have here, I decided I ended up staying another year and I considered one more, but <laughs> <laughs> somebody told me I couldn't. So, well, so it, thank given you. what's happened in the last year, it's great that you've been able to be here. You know, you're right. I, I, I'm glad I was here for the flood. I really am. It's as crazy as that may sound. I'm glad I was here. I'm glad I was able to help and contribute and help the city get through. And um, so thank you all. And uh, we are. We may not be done. There may be some people in the room who want to step, step oh, up and say something. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so you can just sit down and listen if anyone else. I'll call on anyone else. <laughs> yeah. I know. I asked, I, I asked Angel if most people know Angel served on the council. I said, "Would you like to stay for the entire meeting, or, <laughs> or should we go up and uh, have a couple of beers at the Mountaineers game?" So that's where we're going. <laughs> we're going to the Mountaineers game. Tough choice. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, thank you, thank Bob. You all. Angelo, wonderful to see you here. Enjoy the game. Okay, yeah. Great night for a game. <laughs> you you share the credit. I worked I know how hard you work. We work together on many of those things. All right. Well, you're leaving. You're we're you're officially able to leave. All right. Back to Stevens and Associates contract amendment. Bill, you want to? I actually was going. Tim had pulled it up because Senator Jenna Kelly is probably the most knowledgeable. Okay, this one. Do you have a specific question for Kelly or us, or, uh, or just want to chat? Kind of a couple. Um, just looking at it, it, seems like the options that are we're pricing at studying aren't the options that we kind of nodded that we preferred when we after the report. So I know we didn't vote on anything, but um, so I'm just, are these just like the allowable options that FEMA will approve? Is that what we're doing? So it's a step. And I put Bob Stevens here on the line. Um, is that better? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, Kelly Murphy, Assistant City Manager. Uh, well, I'm doing introductions here. Um, so I've got Bob Stevens on uh, the line here to answer specific questions, but this proposal is structured to really get at the codes and standards work. We did bring the final report that you blast to FEMA. Um, and what we need um, in the interim is to do some more detailed work to learn what it will cost to bring um, the buildings up to codes and standards. And then from there, evaluate if we will be reimbursed for the preferred option. 
So this is just a step along the way to get there. Um, the final report that you did get did have numbers in it. Um, and what we're looking to have Stevenson and, Stevens and Associates do is take a closer look at that. Um, what they've got um, in the report are sort of preliminary options. Um, and it's likely that those costs will be actually higher upon further review. Um, this proposal also does consider um, some design work so that we would be able to advance at least to the level of codes and standards, which would be the sort of first level of review. So City Hall, for example, would be elevating utilities and dry flood proofing, um, knowing that we may choose if we're able to, you know, based on the preference of council to, you know, take that mitigation further. Um, but what we want to do first is just make sure that we have accurate estimates um, and we want to be able to provide that really solid baseline number to FEMA because we kind of get, you know, one crack at it. Um, and I'm going to get, turn it over to Bob here, maybe for a little bit more detail, if that's possible. It will be in a moment. There we are. Did I, did I do it? My, uh, Bob, you're on. Uh, welcome, everyone. Bob Stevens. Can you hear me? You're no, breaking up. You're really, really breaking up. Can you? A little choppy. Testing. Can you hear me? Try turning no. off. No. That sometimes helps. Testing. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. You can hear me. Sorry. I'm not sure what was going on with my speaker. My speakers. Um, so Bob Stevens from Stevens and Associates and Kelly kind of summarized that I think very well. As we understood the process for FEMA to establish the amount that they will reimburse as part of insurance and grants, it became clear that this baseline is the minimum required to meet codes and standards. And so we needed to advance the design to increase the accuracy of the cost estimate to establish that baseline cost. Once we have that this step, which is proposed here, done, that will allow us, even at a ballpark basis, to see whether additional funding would be available to move to what we identified last time as the preferred alternative. So as Kelly said, this is step one, you know, and we need to get this um, as accurate as possible because there's also a timeline. Um, we need to get this uh, done and um, uh, and submitted and reviewed and approved by FEMA by early January 25, which means we really need to move fairly quickly with this level of effort. Um, so that um, in consultation with Guidehouse and the recommendations on how to proceed, how we arrived at this, this first step. Tim, do you have some questions? I guess I'm still looking at, it's really the largest consulting we, we've approved since I've been on the city council. So it just feels like it's worth some merit to, to work through this. It So if we're, we're pricing out options that aren't options we really intend to do, like what if we decided to not go with the fire station, sell it and build a new fire station? So um, um, what we're doing here with this amendment and why it is so expensive is because, you know, really um, we need to establish that baseline cost to put everything back based on codes and standards. Those codes and standards are sort of the flood standards um, that we need to meet, but then also things like ADA, life safety, um, and a few other things we need to take a look at to make sure that we're meeting them. Um, so this establishes sort of the baseline for FEMA to take a look at. And then on top of that, we get into the mitigation pieces. And that's where sort of the options within that report come into play. Mm -hmm. And so really, I mean, if you were sort of if it were a binary choice, it would be sort of to fill or not to fill the basement. That's the question, mm -hmm. right? And that will also then lead into other options, um, such as the fire station or what we do with the building over here. But that's all going to be predicated on you know, what FEMA will allow for those costs. But first, we really have to have that baseline cost to then get into um, mitigation factors and then to do um, the baseline cost estimate that they will do. And so this this establishes kind of like the, the baseline, um, what's the cost benefit analysis, sorry. Um, but 
this establishes the baseline, then we'll be looking at mitigation, then we'll be looking at the cost benefit analysis. So it just really sets the floor, if you will, for, you know, what FEMA will look at and what we'll get back from them. And really, we're, we're taking this intermediary step to make sure that we can get sort of the most out of um, the options available. It's also worth noting that FEMA funds the the minimum effort to meet codes and standards first, which so we needed to identify with them, you know, what was the the minimum cost alternative to meet codes and standards. And as that approaches, so other alternatives, then they're willing to discuss funding going to a more extensive alternative. Um, so although, as you say, this may not do, and, and a good deal of this cost is, you know, getting the uh, buildings measured accurately to be able to do um, the, the preliminary design. And that's all data that you're gonna be able to use for whatever you do with City Hall or the current fire station. It's gonna include, you know, uh, flood proofing the fire station as is, which, and, and, and meeting other codes that are not flood. So I, I don't know that I, we were clear. Buildings that have substantial improvements um, trigger uh, having to come up to code with all other standards that the buildings might not be in compliance with currently, like ADA standards. So part of this cost is to look at an elevator in the fire in the fire station, um, to look at uh, fire safety codes that because over time as codes have changed, you may not be compliant with, but those improvements to meet minimum codes and standards would be covered under your insurance plus FEMA grants. So we, we need to do those other code assessments, identify where those gaps are. We need to come up with a conceptual design, get a cost estimate and include that in the cost. And that's how we establish the, the minimum reimbursable from your insurance and FEMA. Once we've done all of that, um, at that point, we still have the conceptual design for say the new fire station or repurposing the old fire station. And then we can start to look to say, you know, are we approaching what those costs are? And FEMA would then be able to agree to spend the money we've identified in the codes and standards minimum towards those other alternatives. So we really have no choice but to go through this step-by-step -step process in order to establish this um, contribution from your insurance plus FEMA grants. Um, that's, how, that's how we establish the cost. And we want that to be what we were advised is that you really want to do due diligence on that cost because to the degree that you've, you know, we we developed conceptual or what we'll call ballpark cost to compare different alternatives for you. Um, and they were relative, those costs were relatively accurate to compare alternatives, but they weren't 100% accurate. So if we don't identify all of the things that are needed to be done, we run the risk of locking in because that's what we'll be doing here is locking in your, insurance and FEMA contribution, um, and then and then perhaps discovering work that needed to be done later as the design developed. So they recommended a 60% design for the minimum codes and standards. Um, I think we've approached a uh, something that's uh, that's a reasonable approach to getting, uh, getting us that far, but I don't know that it's fully 60%. Some areas are, other areas are not. So Bob or Kelly, uh, is there any risk that uh, the cost of this contract won't be covered by FEMA? As far as we know, it will be. Okay. Any other members have any questions? So, Is that a yes? <laughs> I mean, how, does, I mean, FEMA is willing to pay $365,000 to get this information so they can make a decision to spend another multi-million, $10 million. Right. Yes. I mean, so we are, you know, um, bringing this to you based on the guidance that we've received from Guidehouse, um, who is the consultant that the state is working with on these special complex projects. And is it is it oral guidance or did somebody sign a document that said they would do that? So Guidehouse has a contract with the state. Um, it was a verbal conversation, a verbal meeting. Mm -hmm. Guidehouse is a consultant for the state that is helping the state and municipalities through these projects. We have a you know project person. Um, only FEMA can actually sign on the dotted line. 
to say whether they'll cover that, but they tell us this is a fee, this is an eligible cost. But right, I, getting hard answers out of FEMA is you know we we if we don't do this we we won't get any FEMA money, <laughs> and that's what it really boils down to. But this is presumably what right all this the, the process that FEMA is outlining that we're and, being told to do, and all the affected municipalities are getting the same well, guidance presumably. If they have public. If they're doing something, yeah, if they have public losses. Anyone have any other questions? Well, I, I guess I just don't, um, from the proposal, I don't, I, there, there's minimum codes and standards, and then there seem to be alternatives as well that we're estimating now. Why aren't, I mean, uh, and that's, that's sort of, in other words, we came through with, we had a preliminary estimate earlier on a certain amount of work um with rough numbers and fema said we we need better numbers on our minimum which is codes and standards but we seem to be going beyond that in in this and why is that i wouldn't say that we're going beyond in this proposal um right. we are we are meeting we're just do we're standards. just doing the codes and standards yeah. we're not talking about right. we're not estimating the cost of a preferred solution no in yeah. fact what we want to do is be able to set that baseline so that then we have you know we will know from fema then what they will reimburse for so that then we could assess those additional factors those other options that may on, be on our own yeah, yeah that would then mitigate further but it feels like on the scale of minimums which is a word that's been used a few times i guess i'm private sector and have been fending for myself, but I was very impressed with the first Stevenson company report in detail. Um, this level, to me, it's like, for me, it's the equivalent of replacing two elevators or, you know, elevating a couple of homes. I mean, it's a lot of money. Um, and are we really spending it in the best way to benefit our community is my concern. Especially if they don't reimburse us, I think that would be awful. Well, I was seeking assurance that they it would be reimbursed, and I'm comfortable in saying, yeah, this is part of what FEMA does here and across the country. This is part part of their process. So I think we have assurance that we're going to get paid for this contract. Did you have something to add to that, Bill? So just one other thing. So it's you know it's been a year since the floods. There's a deadline for this report to go these numbers to go to fema they'll have to mull it over it'll be uh, be two years by the time they decide i mean is there have they laid out a a an, an overall timeline that we can expect them to make a decision so that we can make a decision and actually get some stuff fixed so i wish we weren't in crystal ball territory here <laughs> um but, you know, what I can say is that with this work that they're doing, you know, and what we've been told is that, you know, this project may be an alternative procedures project, which is what um, Bob is referring to when he refers to this timeline that we've got to work towards. And so there's 18 months from the event to get these sort of cost estimates back to FEMA so that they can evaluate them. Um, and then from there, you know, we will know and we will have a series of other decision points. And so then those factors at this point, we don't know. So we don't know what the timeline will be at that point. Um, but we do know that what we're working towards right now is to establish this codes and standards piece to know what our reimbursement profile will look like from FEMA um, within an 18 month period. And we'll also have some of the designs associated with codes and standards handled based on this uh, amendment. I think one, one thing to think about is this. If we're going to do anything to our buildings, even if we decided not to do anything with FEMA, we have to bring them up to codes and standards. So this is a design cost that we need no matter what. And then we would be spending those millions of dollars out of city money if we weren't getting FEMA money to, to do that work because we have to elevate our own utilities. We have to fix the elevators. We have to do all those things. We have to bring the fire station up. So, so the... So we're on the hook for, do, we have to make these designs no matter what, this is the way to do it in a way that we get paid for by somebody else. Um, with with, with uh, your question about timeline, um, 
I just think we need to face this clearly. This is not going to be fast uh, um, as much as we all wish it were. Uh, you know, Waterbury wasn't in a new town hall after Irene for over five years. Mm. And I mean, I think that's just a reality of mm. the game. And so, I mean, we can try to push things. We're trying to get approval to do some small, you know, repairs and start putting things back together so at least they look better and they're more functional. But in terms of massive um, overhauls or rebuilding or filling basements or putting in, I think it's it's going to be a long run because that's just how FEMA rolls. And um, it's extraordinarily frustrating. I think, you know, we've nearly had an exploding finance director a few times after after calls with FEMA. And, uh, you know, she's not here, but she would agree with me if she were. Yeah, oh, you are. Oh, there you are. Scared. I didn't see you back there. Yeah. yeah. Would you agree with that? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see you back there. You know, it it might. I I think we should approve this contract, but it might make sense to uh, at some point uh, ask someone from FEMA or this contract, you know, this consult consultant from the state to come to us and just give us a briefing on uh, sure. what what the time what, what timeline we can expect and really this the scope of uh what we're dealing with because none of us are experts on this stuff any other council member questions just just oh, one Helen. Oh, uh, thank you so if we approve this contract will we start spending money from our budget or we will just wait to hear from FEMA for the reimbursement. If we are planning to spend some money, what is the- We have to, item? well, yeah. I'm not serious. Yes. yes. We're not serious. We one. have our exploding finance director here to answer that. Yes, um, so we would have to front the money. It is a reimbursement basis, um, the public assistance recovery piece. So once they vetted the amount we would get to go towards this, um, they would start the reimbursement process based on uh, there are options, I think, for them to front some and then for us to reconcile and request reimbursement. Um, but that is also why we have a flood line of credit and a loan from the bond bank for the flood recovery um, so that we have cash flow to be able to do these projects and wait for the money to come back from FEMA. And so that line of credit and the bond, those aren't coming out of our appropriated uh regular general fund budget so right now all of those things exist on their own in a fema fund and it is not impacting the general fund at the moment um, at some point when this is all said and done there may be a true up if our in-kind match or our admin fees um, don't cover the match that the state and the feds don't let they don't cover but i expect that exposure um, to be minimal and i'm doing my very best to keep it minimal um, but at some point in the next year or two years, we would need to, in theory, start building into the budget um, the FEMA match that can be set aside to cover any differential, um, or we would have to long-term bond at the end. Okay. Carolyn, did that answer your question? Um, yeah, so I'm just like, I'm wondering how much money we will spend from uh, city resources. So as far as I understood, we will not, right? Until the uh, reimbursement decision coming from FEMA. It will not affect our general budget, right? Not in this current year, it won't affect yeah. our general fund budget. Okay. Or in or in twenty five, but in mm -hmm. twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, it could. But will uh, will city council have a chance to approve, or when we approve this contract, then it will be done. It's not entirely related to this contract. It's related to all forty six of the damaged inventory items. So it's not just these buildings. We are incurring expenses on pump stations and 
culverts and stormwater and all sorts of things that we took damage from the flood to put back. And so each one of those items goes through as a project to FEMA and they evaluate, ask questions. And then eventually we get to a point after like 10 steps to obligate funds. And then we get the, those funds get passed to the state and then kept to us. Right now, this disaster is a 75% federal disaster. Um, our ERAF is 17.5%. Um, odds are it becomes a 90% disaster. So then the state will kick in, which leaves us exposed for around 3% um, of total costs at this time. But it, until it all shakes out, we don't really know. And some of the costs we've incurred to date involve our own labor that is budgeted. So that's part of our in-kind match that reduces our overall cost share. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions from members of the council? Uh, Steve, I see you're seeking to be recognized. Uh, yes. Steve Whitaker, Whitaker. Um, are the contracts, subcontracts for like the LIDAR and building management built in, are they included in the Stevens percentage? I'm trying to understand from this table, are we talking 11% of 5 million or 11% of six and a half million? What's the total amount going to Stevens? And is that including, are they subbing for the LIDAR work of the building? Revit model and that, that that we heard about. I'll let Bob answer this one. Yeah, happy to. So um, on the proposal, there's a table on page five, which breaks down the total cost for this amendment. And a portion of that is a percentage, which is the architectural structural NMEP, which is a percentage of the estimated cost for the work that's being designed. And that is based upon you know, typical design percentages and the fact that we're doing 20, 25% of that effort for a project of that scale. And then you'll see after that, a whole series of things that are not basic architectural services, including all of the subcontractors. So the answer specifically, the LIDAR is a subconsultant and it is included in our total fee. The historic preservation subconsultant is included in our fee. Um, there's money for code assessments. Uh, some of those code assessments may be done by subcontractors. We may do some of that in-house and so on. So um, this proposal is meant to be exclusive of all the design work necessary. The cost estimator is another subcontractor, but um, we intended this proposal to be inclusive of all of the work necessary to develop these designs and cost estimates to meet this package uh, in early November to send to FEMA, which would cover a um, you know, 25, 30% design effort for these, all, these three alternatives. Um, and, yeah. So thank you, that, that, that helps. Uh, some of you may recall when we paid to design a garage that never got built, that the architect claimed ownership of the 3D model of that engineering work. Uh, will the city have clear ownership of the point cloud data from LIDAR and the 3D Revit model? I'm happy to answer that as well. So um, in the design industry, design professionals do claim ownership of the creative aspect of design. If you're designing a new structure, there's an element of that that... Um, uh, belongs to the design professional until they're paid in full. And then it then it transfers over to the owner. Um, and most of this work, including the LIDAR and the, and the 3D model, all of that is being done and um, would be would be owned by the by the city and uh, made available for any future work. So we we're, we're for those who don't know what the LIDAR model is, today's uh, method of creating existing condition drawings is to send a basically a very sophisticated camera inside and it accurately measures every square inch of the building. So it's very accurate, it's very valuable for future work. So you'll have a you'll have a new 3D model of the fire station and the city hall, not the police station, because there's very minimal work in the police station. But the two, those two buildings will have new um, uh, 3D models uh, and that you'll be able to use in the future. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Okay, anything else from the council? 
Can I finish my questions? Well, I'm I'm curious about your time. You how many questions do you have? Uh, just two, I think. What? Okay, why don't you get them both out? Okay. Yeah. No, I think I more time was used in responses than it were my questions, as far as your. Uh, so why don't you tell us, say your questions? Uh, what's our contingency plan if FEMA doesn't pony up and we're on the hook for, you know, three percent exposure of six and a half million is what I think I heard our treasurer say, but we could be eleven percent of six and a half million if if I'm reading this correctly. Okay. And your second question? Um Yeah, I guess is this an uh, an undefined loan amount that Montpelier citizens are loaning to the feds on the chance that we might get paid back? I don't think that's a fair characterization. I think the fair characterization is that the, this is uh, as has been described to us. These are FEMA eligible expenses, uh, and there's every expectation they will be. Uh, paid back. This is not a casino operation we're uh, going into. And will the contract subcontracts from our Stevenson contract be available under public records law? I mean, this is a problem with putting things in, into subcontracts is that I can't get to City Hall. Those contracts won't exist here unless we specifically amend the contract or make sure that that provision is within the contract with Stevens. Well, if, if they're in the possession of the city, there will be public records. No, you're missing my point, or you're avoiding it. The contract to with Stevens, if they're going to do the, all this other work, LIDAR, et cetera, under subcontracts, our contract with Stevens needs to include that copies of all those subcontract documents be transferred to the city's possession such that they will be available to the public. We can consult with our legal counsel about that. So just just to clarify, when you say they need to be, that you would like that to be, that is not necessarily a legal requirement. That said, we'll we'll check with Mr. Stevens and see what we can do. Well, transparency, if we know your I'm not arguing if your I'm intent saying... is to hide the true costs and the potential overages of this. Okay, no one's no one's intending to hide anything. Your your question's been answered. Folks. Members of the council, are there any other questions? Is there a motion? Is there a motion to direct the city manager to execute this contract? I will move that. I don't think we have much choice. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? I just, because I'm going to vote no, I think I'd like to just say that I, I feel that um, the, the costs that we're incurring, we're also going to look at the costs of a couple of years, potentially, of not being able to use our facilities to capacity. And I'm just having, just knowing, because I'm doing this on our own properties and we're bringing them back. Um, we aren't going through these levels because we can't and we don't have to. But it just feels like it's so much money to do something that I know we're doing in other places for a lot less. Um, and we're doing it right. We're trying to do it well. We're hiring good contractors. You know, when you put in an elevator, we don't. Have, it, it, the elevator companies help with the design and, and bring in all those code pieces. I feel like there's just some duplication here over what's help happening elsewhere. I just can't support it right now. If, if you get um, the federal folks to come in and, and explain the process a little better, maybe that would help. But at the moment, I'm just, it just feels like kind of overkill for me. I don't see any, anyone else have Members of the council have anything to say before we move to a vote? I, I think this is everything that we have to do. We're And this is all work that we have to get uh, done and present the work product to FEMA 
so that we could get many millions of dollars from FEMA that is then many millions of dollars that the uh, taxpayers of Montpelier are not paying uh, for for these buildings. And it starts with getting this uh, this work done. And so I it was it was on the consent agenda because it really didn't seem like it was going to be that controversial, but one never knows. But if there's no other comments, I will uh, start the vote and we'll start a roll call because I know it's, I expect it to be a not unanimous vote. Um, starting on this end, Lauren? Yes. Uh, Palin? Yes. Tim? No. Sal? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Adrian? Yes. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Adrian, I just noticed you got your your permanent uh, nameplate. Congratulations. All right, next up we have community fund board recommendations. Hi all, uh, Chris is there in person. This is Mairead. Um, I've got some slides to share and also a uh, a spreadsheet of our recommended amounts. And I'm not sure process-wise if it worked. I guess I can't share via chat. I could email. It's a, it's in Google, but I can download and email it to Mary to send to you all. I can also project and just show it to you here first for us to all look at together. Well, if you have it on your computer, mm -hmm. I think you can call it up and then you will be given permission to share it. And I think I got the thumbs up so saying that you have permission to share your screen. Okay, but great. You can go ahead and do that. Okay, great, thank you. So I'm gonna start with our slides that give just a brief overview from our decision-making process this year. And Christopher, feel free to jump in. He's in the room, I think, still in person um, with anything that I miss. So uh, we had a, a, so this is for the um, 2025 grant cycle. Our board has currently have four people on it. Um, and so we still have room for one more if anyone wants to volunteer from the audience. Uh, we are actually looking for a member. Um, but so we had a bit of a our work cut out for us this year. There are obviously a lot of pressing needs and this fund is designed to cover a really wide variety of um, different needs in our community. So when we were going through and considering, you know, when we had to make some tough decisions, uh, things, the priorities that we were considering were mainly flood resilience and housing, just in light of what the past year has been like for us all. Uh, we did have an overall increase in applications of around $10,000, but we were working with the same budgeted amount for to give out awards as we were in the 2024 cycle. So a little bit more pressure on uh, the total funds than in the past funding cycle. We also saw, this was just an interesting point, we thought we'd bring to everyone's attention that there was an increase in the proportion of requested funds for the arts compared to the previous grant cycle. And I'll show you in the next page what that looks like specifically. So this breaks down the last two years, the requests that we receive and the awards that we are recommending um, we give out from the fund. So in 2024, we had a total at about 257, well, almost $256,000 um, requested. And out of that 63,000 was arts and the rest was kind of other, um, other needs. And the total award amount that we gave out 132,450, that amount became our fixed amount for this cycle. So this cycle, we had an increase, a $10,000 incre increase in requests for a total of about 266,000. Out of that, though, there was this big increase in arts requests with you know $97,000. So we tried to keep that proportionality in mind also as we were making awards. Uh, so this, you know, I'll share these slides um, in, I guess, PowerPoint format with Mary via email so that you'll have that on record. Um, uh, two, before I dig into specific awards, uh, two questions, concerns, things that we wanted to bring up for the future. 
the big one that was on our minds a lot was this continually each year we're seeing an increase in the um, the number of sometimes but mainly the total amount of um of funds that are coming in as requests um but the amount that we are able to give out is you know limited by that that amount that we had asked for we did ask for an increase uh, over the past year but um, we're not giving it. So we're a little bit concerned that if that pattern continues, if we still are working with this really limited set of funds, but getting increasing requests, and we're having to say no to more of them, that eventually that might push some applicants back to the ballot. And the entire purpose of having this structure is to make that ballot more approachable, not you know super, super long with a lot of specific requests. Um, so we hope that the council keeps this in mind as we're going forward, looking at the next year cycle, um, consider increasing the total amount of funds available for um, the community fund. And then we also had a couple of questions just about, um, I guess, process. These things come up a lot. We we meet you know, a couple of times a year and do this whole thing. We have, I think this question also came up last year, um, which was there are a couple of applicants that we, the, the board would like to share feedback with directly um, about their applications and a little bit unsure about how how we should go about doing that. Um, obviously our meeting in which we make these decisions is open to the public. We don't typically get much attendance. So if someone shows up in there, they'll they'll know about those sort of questions that we had. But we were wondering uh, kind of after the fact how how we might improve processes for um, sharing feedback with, with some of our applicants. So that's the overview. Um, I will I'm going to switch over to the tab now that shows the specific amounts. This is really big. Oh, wait. Sorry, I'm going to stop share. Wrong version. That's the big one. I wanted to do the small one. <laughs> this is Christopher's very detailed every single one for the past several years. I made a simple one. While you're looking for it, I just yes, wanted good. to make another comment as well. Yeah. Uh, the in a, you know it, it's sort of a little bit masked that there's only a ten thousand dollar increase in requests. There's actually a fifty percent increase in applications. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot more no's that mm -hmm. we had to make this year over the previous year. So last year we had thirty two requests. This year we had forty eight requests. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine that that's going to get any smaller. Um, and I do think, as as was mentioned, that it may mean that some organizations that are getting less than they want from the community fund or are getting denied um, may choose to go uh, to the voters directly at town meeting day, um, which I think is not what you're hoping for out mm -hmm. of this process. Yes. Okay, I found it. My file organization, my my, what's it called? Naming conventions were not up to snuff. All right, here we go. Um, thank you, Christopher, for adding that in. All right, so this is um, this is a two year comparison. We left the twenty four in there. Um, we look at that, you know, when we're several past years history when we're making these recommendations, but our 25 is this um, far right column that's probably teeny tiny for you all. I'll make it bigger <laughs> and zoom in. All right, so um, we've got this far column is the amount recommended and E um, and D is the amount that was requested. We were really not able to give the full amount for many um, grants at all. When we made awards, we for the most part are making a partial award. Um, so these are general fund ones that are at the top. Uh, we've got all, all brains belong. Um, we recommended 750 out of 3,800. American Red Cross, we said not to fund. Do you all want me to go through line by line like this to just state the amount? You all have the I don't list. think, I don't think you need to do that. We okay. have those amounts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, they're, you know, as you can see, it be, the main thing that we wanted to draw everyone's attention to is that fact that there are just very few things that we are able to fund fully. Um, most things we were making a making a partial award, if any award at all. Um, Mairead, I, I was wondering as you were uh, presenting the the big categories mm -hmm. uh, for year over year. Did you if uh, 
did you notice groups that got uh, zero awards last year coming back again this year or or dropping out this year? Mm. That is a good question. Some folks who did not, who got a zero award did come back again this year and ask for another. We do have last year's data here. Um, some came back asking for more. Some came back with the same ask. Um, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, some came back with a lower ask and a, a lot of new ones. Okay. Yeah. We honestly generally didn't fund many new projects. Yeah. Adrian. So thank you for this presentation and for the information. Um, I know this has been a long standing um, board for the city. And I think just, and I will say most of the people on this list are all my friends <laughs> and I love them. And they're the most amazing organizations. They make Montpelier what we are, and that's why we live here. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I was wondering was, do how do other cities across the country fund mm -hmm. organizations like this? Because just thinking about how we're stretched at the city, how this comes out of the general fund, how you're, you know, the increase of applications, the increase of funding, like this is going to be here. Like there's going to be a need in our community and can our general fund continue to support, you know, the increased applications over time? So I was just wondering how other cities fund these types of activities. Are there foundations? Are there organizations? Like, do they come out of the city's general funds normally? Like, what is the structure that, you know, partner cities may have? And mm -hmm. are we, is this a best practice? I just wanted to learn a little bit more about the history of that. This might be. Yeah, I'll, time. I'll, well, you know, I think I sent you the, the history of it. Um, I can't really speak definitively for around the country because every state has a different sort of funding and revenue mechanism. I know, for example, a community used to work in the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, it gets a, they're a direct recipient of CDBG funds, community development block grant. So they use those monies for this program. We're not a direct recipient. We have to apply for the state for CDBG money. So only for, and there's specific criteria. So we're not eligible to do that. So speaking Vermont, particularly every agency in here, in every town and city has the right to petition to be on the ballot. And um, so there, there's a little bit of an end around we're, we're we can be on the hook for spending this money out of our general fund anyway. Many communities now do this kind of thing where you apply and they do a screening and put through. Most agencies, and that may change, as you pointed out, given the, the things that haven't been funded, it's easier than going out and getting 600 names on a signature, particularly in the winter, getting ready for town meeting, and certainly during the COVID years. Um, so people liked this process. Um, but the alternative if we were to just cut this out, as I would predict that uh, something close to the 200 and some odd thousand total asks would be on our ballot mm -hmm. in March and voters would be voting yes or no on those items. And they'd probably be one at a time. So they'd be, what would you say, 48 applicants? There were uh, 48 applicants. So there would be 48 additional ballot items. So some, of, some of us remember when we used to have 20 or 30 ballot items uh, that way. And it was just created by the city council to try to manage the process, not have all the ballot items to, and to um, have a, have the applications actually screened by a group so that the money was going to the, the most effective places, not that everybody isn't deserving. Uh, so it's, it's a conundrum. Uh, I know in the state, I think everybody does it. You know, we, for years, we had a policy that if you had been, if you had been on the ballot, and we're and the voters passed you and you're asking for the same amount we just put it in the budget at, as a line and if you were either wanted an increase or you're a new person then new agency then you had to petition to be on but once you've been passed once or twice then you went into the base and that kept growing so at some point the council said this you know this is kind of just worth the, the will of wh whatever somebody asks for and whether they get petitions let's do this more thoughtfully and so that's how we ended up with this process. So 
you know, I, it's a great question. I'd also say just uh, from our perspective that if these services weren't in place and we weren't paying for them this way, we would be paying for them through other, through our police department, through our fire department, through our other services, we'd be creating positions to deal with these issues. Many of these people are dealing with issues that are, are not our expertise, but they're handling problems and issues that are in the community that people need these services. Yeah, I'm not saying we shouldn't fund these yeah. because these are critical. To, that's why we live here. These are very important services. I'm just wondering if we should explore other opportunities for grants like the community block grant you said we're not eligible for as a city, but are there, and maybe the grant committee can take a look. I will charge myself into exploring opportunities um, that may help supplement this, especially if you do increase your applications, like how can we expand this program that is not, you know, taking money from the general fund of Montpelier, like that, how can we supplement this budget and even increase it so that we can support those applications, but think creatively on where there is funding that we can secure. Um, that's what I'd be interested in seeing. Councilor Gill, I'm sure the committee would be happy to talk to you about <laughs> any ideas. <laughs> Uh, for increasing the budget. Uh, we do have one question that I I think may be for the city manager, but um, it could also be answered by the council. Um, as you know, it's sometimes hard to fill these positions on city commissions and committees. Um, and we were wondering if it is possible to recruit from the youth population of the city for membership right. of this commission. Do you have to be 18? Hmm. I don't think so. I don't think so. Great. Thank you. We'll be talking to the high school. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. so you, you may have noticed that there is a, a, an item later on on the agenda about creating a youth uh, youth committee awesome. to in, uh, encourage more, uh, <clears throat> more involvement from, from younger people in the community. Great. So, so many of these proposals obviously affect youth, yeah. are driven by youth, organized by youth, that would be great to have their voice. Mm -hmm. So what you're asking for tonight is our approval of the uh, the recommendation for all, all these expenditures. The mon money's already been appropriated by the voters, but how the money is allocated is decided based on your recommendation to us. Yes, sir. Correct. Any council members have any questions or, or thoughts? Lauren. And I would just thank the committee just being doing this work is so important and valuable. So really grateful. Um, and I do think like the ability to go through thoughtfully and just understand, you know, what is going to be most impactful for the community so that we can be putting forward a suite of things. Um, that's great. So thank you for that work. Um, I, I love the idea of exploring if we could partner with some foundation or something to supplement these, these needs, if there was some, you know, way we could set something like that up. Seems like a great thing to explore. Um, but in the meantime, just wanted to say thank you all. Steve, are you seeking to be recognized? Yes, please. Steve Whitaker again. Uh, I'm curious about the scrutiny or due diligence of looking at other sources. I know that Good Samaritan Haven got a $5 million from the Housing Conservation Board, and they don't need $18,000 from us right now. You know, they're only taking care of about half of the unhoused population. You know, they're keeping cameras on people sleeping, you know transgender bathroom battles going on at our shelter without any public records transparency. You know, the just basics, I appreciate that they run the food pantry and potentially have a hand in the farm up there, but their, their $15,000 here is going to food delivery, which is directly competing against the food for the unhoused to on a walk-in basis because the boxes for the food delivery get packaged and whisked out the door before the people who have no refrigeration or no cook kitchen get to pick it up. So I just think that these nonprofits are not sufficiently 
accountable or transparent to, for, you know, we hold a budget priority public hearings, and yet all of this stuff is in effect off budget. We didn't get to comment on any of this stuff while we were putting the budget together, and now it's being paid out of out of our funds. So there, these non I'm curious about the the teen center. Is is it even? Did it relocate? Is it functional right now? Because it's certainly not in our city hall basement. But do they need fifteen thousand if they're going to be out of business for another year? But Montpelier Live asked for ten and a half, ten thousand five hundred, and was zeroed out. Montpelier Live played an invaluable role, better than city government, I would say, in the flood response. And yet we're zeroing them out when they're most strategically positioned to partner the business community with the unhoused to, to, to create some bathrooms and showers or job opportunities, or to maybe do a better job than our city management on getting the Wi-Fi, you know, up and running. It's, I, I think that this is not well-informed and it's not accountable to the city government. You can't delegate uh, your responsibilities as council members to this unelected board to then do a half scrutinized job, but to give another 18,000 to Good Samaritan Haven while they've got $5 million sitting in the bank or some portion remaining thereof, it's just absurd. So, you know, Montpelier Live play, played a role in finding cooling services and getting the tourist center and public restrooms. You know, I, you've never heard me say good things about Montpelier Live in the past it is because of the transparency and the accountability, but there's new leadership there that uh, didn't have me arrested for making a public art display of public toilet, the lack thereof, five years later, and y'all have done nothing about that. You know, I hope you sleep well at night. Thank you. Any other member of the public wishing to speak on this issue? Or is there, is there a motion to approve this uh, proposal? Move approval. Is Second. there any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. And and Maureen and Chris, thanks for doing this work. It's uh, it's a lot to go through all these proposals and uh, make informed judgments about what how we should be spending our money. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks all. Next up, we have uh, traffic calming. I think we have two residents here that would like to speak to this while they're coming up and introducing themselves. I'll just say we did receive a formal request uh, from uh, residents near the Cummings Street area and have received a second inquiry at least uh, about uh, another area. Uh, and the requester, although neither of you are Larry, but uh, that's okay, uh, had asked specifically that the work be done. We're going to be paving Cumming Street later this year, and that, that work be done co consistent with that. As And some of you may recall that the council went through, the council and the uh, traffic committee went through a pretty extensive process to develop a policy for evaluating these things. So this is actually our first request since we've adopted the policy. So I just want to tee that all up, turn it over to, I think, the requesters. My name is Piper Nevins. This is my wife, Patricia Shagnon. We are residents of Cumming Street. And I wanna thank you for putting this on the agenda. I have learned through this process that this is a new process and we're actually grateful to be able to be heard. Um, it is a long standing issue, I understand, though we are new residents. We have uh, been there for a year and a half. And in the short amount of time that we've been there, we are the ones who had our home hit by the truck and i'm gonna say an inebriated driver and it's a resident of the street um so uh, we've we've had to deal with some significant challenge um our welcome to the to the town um and that alerted us to the issue um and of course because we live on the town we interact with a great deal of the speeding that happens there um but we've come to to recognize that um that, that 
part of it, the issue is that the the, the residents at the end of the street, and I, I don't mean to be able to, to point a finger, but that is unfortunately a chronic issue. We have since learned from the police um, that it is a chronic issue. Um, so we did have this incident where our, our house was hit by a speeding truck. Um, and there are incidences, for example, of four wheelers that are regularly speeding up and down the street. And even as recently as two weeks ago, um, it, again, one of these residents was um, speeding and hit and completely broke a telephone pole. Um, it, these are just a couple of incidents of which we're aware that impacted us uh, directly. Um, it, it also, I, I thought was interesting to realize in living there that, um, um, it's FedEx, it's UPS, it's Domino's delivery, it's all of those things, also are speeding on that road, um, as well as um, the even the uh, the town shuttle bus speeds on that road. So while on the one hand, we sort of found ourselves targeting some of the residents of the street, it's actually broader than that. Um, and um, it, what we really wanted to bring to the council's attention is this, this street, I think, is perhaps different than some others. It's not a main artery by any stretch of the imagination. It is an offshoot, small road, but it's a primary access to the North Branch trails. So while the residents absolutely are aware of issues, it's actually impacting a larger part of the Montpelier population. So we have an awful lot of people who walk their dogs people who walk their children, uh, people who are bicycling, uh, people who are cross-country skiing, any number of activities that Montpelier really wants to boast and be proud of and have access to the North Branch Trails. Um, we don't have sidewalks and the houses are really literally right on the road. Um, there's no place for people to even hop off the road. Um, it, it's really gotten to a point where it's, well, quite literally dangerous. And um, I take care of dogs. I'm constantly concerned about dogs. There are plenty of people who live there who have small children. They're very concerned about their small children. I don't like to be alarmist, but it does seem to me that we're just a ticking time away from an animal or a human being hurt, seriously hurt. And so we would really like to bring this to your attention and ask, please, would you consider um, speed bumps for this road? We have worked with police. We have asked how to best do this. Sergeant Philbrick has been very supportive, uh, put up um, monitors of speed, which apparently there's a process for that. It's a limited amount of time where they collect the data, but they have collected it. Um, the rest of this uh, police department has been very supportive and asked us to call continuing continually whenever there is an issue that happens we have done that they've been very supportive there's a lot of reasons that we've had to call and um, there's an awful lot of times that we've had to have police come out and and follow up on this we'd really like to um have you all consider allocating funds where the um paving is already planned uh to have these speed bumps put in that could significantly aid in the safety of the residents as well as people accessing the North Branch Trail. I know that my neighbor who has been on the street for over 30 years, I believe, Jeannie Lowell is also on the call. I don't think she dropped out. Did she drop out? No, she's here. Okay. And I know that she wanted to speak to some of the longevity of the issue. This is not isolated and it's not just happening in the time that we have been there. Um, and I also wanted to make mention of Larry Martin, who is the um, landlord of the apartment building that is also on Cumming Street, who has also had to deal with speeders hitting his apartment building and having to fix a great deal of damage. Um, these, again, they're not isolated incidences and we would just really implore your considering allocation of, of funds for speed bumps for that street. Thanks. Do any members of the council have any questions? No. Um, okay, have, have you been in touch with the Department of Public Works to have, have have you at this point filled out the application? Yes, sir. Okay. And and where does that stand? Oh, as far as I know, I've submitted it. 
And that was the extent of my awareness of what needed to happen. Um, I did ask for a reply, but I know that people are, are busy and I didn't receive one. So I'm just hoping it's out there and has been received. Um, I know that Larry was able to submit his and had contact that it, yes, had been received. Um, I know that two um, uh, residents of the apartment complex have submitted um, as well, as well as uh, Jeannie Lowell, as well as Sierra Lowell. Um, all of us who are um, residents on the street who've, who've uh, had direct impact um, have submitted in order to support this um, system that you folks have. If there's something more that we need to do, we're very ha happy to do it. Um, I know again that that uh, Sergeant Philbrick has uh, collected a, an amass of data and we've asked questions around how best to present this to you folks if we needed to have um, numbers of the incidences, like there are, there are numbers attached to each incident that was not recommended at this stage. I'm not sure if there's another stage where you would need that. If we need to compile that, we'll do that for you. So first I can confirm we, re we received your oh, thank you. application. And the, the process that really follows is doing just that, collecting all that data, all the numbers, putting that all together. That's part of what happens next. And I think this came up, we were contacted first by Mr. Martin, and he said, can I go to the council meeting? And we said, sure. And he welcome to go to the council today. meeting. <laughs> yes. but, well, it, it's great that you folks are here. It, it, it was like, yes, you can. And we have this process. So you should file the application. Right, right. But it's, you know, it's great to raise the awareness of the issues and why we're doing it. It's of course up to the council, whether they cool. send us through the process or just make their own decision. If I understood, I, I wanted to make sure I understood you correctly, if I may. Um, did Did you need us to collect that? data no I or is think... that another what's that yeah yeah the police chief's here and he's delightful sending Perfect. you stuff right now delightful yeah there, there's a whole process up uh, to to give a little background um for a few years i was on the committee called the montpelier transportation infrastructure committee and we spent a good bit of time going developing a a process to evaluate requests for traffic calming because we feared well there there might be any number of people who want traffic calming in their neighborhood and uh, you can't just necessarily say yes to everybody who wants one so sure. we uh, we developed this whole process to uh, get feedback from all the residents in the neighborhood to uh, to measure the amount of traffic and the speed of traffic going through. Um, I don't remember what yeah. all the- uh, I believe there's another piece where were. the residents are notified or um, asked if this is something that they would support. So my understanding is that that piece happens at some point. Yes. I am not clear when that happens. And a piece of what we're curious about um, it is because it seems uh, that the DPW has in fact been prepping the street for paving. Um, we want to make sure that we're timely and able to dovetail with mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and what I can say is that uh, one of, we're one of the things we we're concerned about is that um, we want to make sure that all the residents are heard because the the one there might be a couple of people who really strongly favor it and uh, get very motivated to do everything that you've done but uh, but once we talk to all the neighbors we might find out well there's only two people who want it i'm not saying that's the case in your neighborhood but it's it's the kind of thing that can happen and nobody's ever got have, has ever done this before for as long as we we've only had the policy for a few years but nobody's ever uh initiated the process taken it's not the, true no well I'll, I'll get to you uh Jeannie, but okay. uh, but we've not had this process happen before and so um i'm very interested in seeing how the process plays out um and Adrian. I'll, I'll, I'll just say that 
the word process scares me a little bit in the situation. I feel like there is a sense of urgency. I have read the number of incidences on your street and there's clearly an issue. Yeah. And if I live there, I would be very concerned about my children. Yeah. I know that they play out in the streets. There's dogs. I mean, I frequent that area with my bike and there is a process. I understand collecting data. Like I am a data driven person and I understand that that structure is in place, but I would like for us to consider, we do have some data. There is some reportable incidences. You know, maybe there's recommendation from DPW, the police department, like what can be done as a stop gate now to prevent continued accidents, um, I mean, it's not just traffic. It looks like there's a whole slew of mm -hmm. reportable items on the street. So there's traffic is one issue, but there's, you know, what is the root cause? What are some ways that we can boost this neighborhood so that people feel safe? It's, you know, open to neighbors. It's a welcoming area. I mean, that's what we want for all of our neighborhoods. And I'm hearing that's not how it feels. And some of the data is reflecting that. So what do we do now while simultaneously going through that process of traffic calming? Because we do have that process, but I feel like that's just not good enough for the right now to make sure that our neighbors are protected. And God forbid a child gets hit because a car is flying down the road. I don't want that coming to city council. I don't want that on my shoulders. So I feel like the flag is being worn for us. Thank you for your support. Lauren. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, I feel like a while ago we'd had some presentations from the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee where there were like a number of things like you can put like planters out or something like you. So I wonder if there's like a temporary thing we could try as we go through this process, um, you know, to, to see it. Can we, through some non-permanent means, you know, try this out, see if this is successful? And be going through the process in the meantime for a more permanent solution. I mean, I it does seem frustrating if we're going to end up paying more money to do this in six months if we're paving the road this summer. So I don't know how long this process needs to take if there's a way to try to sync it up and do it. Um, but I don't know what the timeline for paving is. Um, it, like how how imminent that is. But like it would it seems like it would be ideal if we could try to do this process, get through it and line it up so that if we're paving the road already, that that could be built into the paving plan and minimize costs at least. Um, but also just wondering about in the meantime, if if we could like send to our transportation committee the I just remember there were a whole bunch of things you could do with like cones or like <laughs> yeah. things like that that are like you could just put out that can that do work to slow down traffic. Um, so there might be other alternatives in the meantime. <laughs> Bill, do you know, um, did you uh, find out from the Department of Public Works if there's a cost differential? So there are, yeah, so, so there are a couple of people on from Public Works right now. I think they're trying to figure out who the who should be responding to this. Uh, both Kurt and Corey are on. Corey kind of handles this. Uh, so I think I see Corey's line up. And so they'll be able to give you um, give you a little bit more handle on on it from their perspective great i will call on corey but first uh tim had his hand up with a question or just comment. thinking kind of along the line lauren was and coming streets on my one of my regular running routes so i i've spent some time over there but uh, and i'm quite slow so i spend more time than i should but <laughs> I'll it's, make um, wave. <laughs> but it's just thinking about immediate things like as soon as we pave it it's going to be a runway right um is there some logic to saying dirt roads in and of themselves are a bit of a traffic calming technique um not yet <laughs> but it will be worse paved oh. if you i it's like every time we do a paving project we have police afterwards to check on people because people speed up when it's a nice smooth piece so just something to think about and, and the other one is just thinking of temporary measures that you see using once in a while um i've seen some bigger employers in town have like the temporary speed bumps they can install in their parking lots, but then they pick them up in the winter for plowing and things. But it would seem like if you had something like that, you could put down and move around, then it, it keeps people on their feet more than if it's just like one on each end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'd let uh, one of our experts speak to that. There may be, some of those may not be approved for public road use. They might only be for private use, but I'll let Corey answer that. Corey, you're up. Hey, can you hear me okay? 
Yes. Yes. Um, so the the idea of the uh, cost savings. So when the city contracts their citywide paving program, um, it's usually with a very large paving contractor um, who is still probably going to give you a premium price to do work like this, even if it's part of the overall contract. Whereas if you come in later with a smaller contractor who maybe does a lot of driveways and parking lots and, and road patches um, and may already have work signed up for Montpelier in Montpelier, it's easy for them to mobilize, come in and do this and give you a pretty good price on it. So I'm not completely um, confident that the price savings is there, um, making it part of the overall paving budget and doing it separately. Um, the other thing I heard, so yeah, Tim just mentioned, um, you know, the when a street is paved, typically, yes, the streets, the, the speeds go up. Um, what we want to do and what our plan is to do is to collect that data that we need after the street is paved so we know what that is. Right now, there's no um, variable that can be plugged in that can give you a um, exact what the difference is going to be between what a street is and what the speeds are going to be after a, a street is resurfaced. So we want to make sure we know the conditions on the street so that the appropriate measures can be put in. Um, so that is that was our plan when we received these. Actually, it was our plan back. Uh, we received a, a request for this neighborhood before, and that was the plan was to pave the street, collect the data, go through the process. Um, and that still is the plan, unless we hear otherwise. Um, and that will also, you mentioned something in the short term, that data will also allow us to um, work with the police for pinpoint enforcement because it'll break it down per 15 minutes of the day. So they don't have to spend all day out there. Certain times a day, we're seeing higher speeders. Um, we can give that to them to help them enforce the speed limit on that street. And Corey, um, the question was raised about uh, temporary measures like uh, putting flower pots or something or putting those temporary uh, speed bumps. Um, and then the other question I have is, is the speed limit there 25 the way it is in the rest of the city? It is, yes. Okay. So what about those uh, temporary measures, the uh, the movable berms and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing written into the current policy about that. It doesn't mean things can't be tried. Um, there's just no exact language that says it's appropriate here, it's not appropriate there. These items are appropriate. There's nothing, it doesn't go into temporary measures. Uh huh. Are you the person who's responsible for administering the overall traffic calming uh, policy? So yeah, I work with the traffic committee to um, to do that. May I ask a question? In our in our typical, this was kind of a, a monkey wrench that was thrown into this here because um, you know our typical we would receive an application, get back to that person with the process. We plan to collect data. Etc. This it doesn't usually come to the council like this at the early stage. You guys see it at the end of the process and approve the final plan. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we haven't immediately gotten back to any of the applicants, that's why this this meeting kind of, we knew this meeting was happening. So we'll respond afterwards. And a couple of questions that follow follow on that are: um, How long? Is, how much time is built into having this process take and uh, would it still, would it take so long that it would push it out beyond uh, this year's uh, paving season? So we rely on the Regional Planning Commission to use their um, speed tubes for data collection. Uh -huh. So some of it is reliant on their schedule. The other, the other, way this was intended to work was uh, we go through this process and then we have the ability to go through a budget session and we can identify traffic coming projects within the CIP so we're prepared for it monetarily. Um, and then we would construct the next year. That's how it was intended to flow. I see. Would, would it be okay if I say a thing or two? Um, uh, first, I wanted to ask the question that there, there have in fact been data collected on the street as a dirt road. Um, I, I think it would be obvious that it's only going to increase as a paved road, but regardless, 
the data has in fact been collected, could that be used and speed the process forward? And then also closely on the heels of that, um, and Jeannie will speak to this more clearly, but um, there have been requests put in as Going back to 2017. So it, it's it's really not new. And while I recognize that the process is new, and I recognize that that you know we're all learning how to navigate that process, the topic is not, and engagement with the community is not new. Okay, Adrian, I think I saw your hand. Had your hand up. Okay, um, Jeannie, you don't have your hand up now. Do you want to be recognized? <clears throat> Um, I don't have a way to raise my hand for some reason, so I'm doing it this way. Okay, well, I'll, I'll recognize you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm <clears throat> I'm sorry I'm not there, but I've been traveling for three and a half weeks, and those of you who know me can tell from my appearance that this is vacation head. Um, so I'm glad to be able to participate via Zoom. Uh, I hope you can hear me better than I can hear you. Um, I heard a couple of points I want to address, I, but first I will begin with the historical perspective on this. Um, Piper and Pat are correct that I started this conversation requesting speed bumps, not in 2017, but in 2018. And I have, I can document the uh, email exchange with Tom McCardle and Corey Lane, and it's some, some guy, Zach, was involved at some point. Um, and when I commented that we haven't been through this process before was not true, what I meant was it has been raised before. And in a June 9th, 2022, I'm going I'm to skip over the history of all the email exchanges, but in June of 2022, Corey um, said that he considers my email or emails as, a, as an initial request for the Transportation Committee to consider, quote, so when the plan is approved, Cumming Street will already be in the queue and we can start the process. So, and that's the last word I had then. I followed up in May of this year and I didn't get any further emails on it. Um, but I do wanna comment on my, I wanna make some comments about my read of the Transportation Committee Traffic Control Program document. I don't know if that's the correct title, but it's the thing that contains the application. Um, as has been said, I won't belabor the point, but Cumming Street has a seriously dangerous problem with speeding vehicles that's already caused substantial damage to personal property. I want to add to those two incidents, um, an incident that happened very recently in my front yard in the middle of the day. I was standing in my front yard. My 10-year-old granddaughter was just across the street in my neighbor's front yard, neither of us very far away from the street, which by the way, is a narrow, barely two lane street. There's no room for planters. That would be very nice or a median or whatever. There's really no room for accessories like that. Um, but back to the point that I was making, um, a very large pickup truck came speeding down, came across the bridge around the corner and gunned it. I don't know how fast they were going, but they were going so fast that the truck fishtailed its tail end going um, 45 degrees one way, 45 degrees the other way, three times. I was afraid that either I or God forbid my granddaughter was gonna be struck down by it. My granddaughter was terrified. So that's not involving personal property. That's, in, that's involving the safety of life and limb. And while I'm a great proponent of the democratic process, the popular vote is not appropriate to rely on when it comes to safety measures. So I, especially when the source of the problem, it's the, the majority of the people on our street 
live down at the end of the street, and that's where the source of the problem is. So um, it frightens me to think that this is going to be determined by popular vote. Um, okay, so someone already mentioned there's no sidewalks. Not that sidewalks would really provide any degree or any measure of safety because what we're talking about has no disregard, has no regard rather for houses or telephone poles. Sidewalks are not going to be any effective means of safety. Um, so the, uh, the, the document that I'm referring to, I don't know the correct name, traffic, traffic calming document defines would the definition of a neighborhood street is what would define coming street. Um, and uh, speed bumps are the only identified measure that would effectively reduce speed on that street. So according to the criteria in the document, speed bumps would one, help ensure speeds reasonable for a neighborhood setting, would increase safety for non-motorized users, would reduce collision frequency and severity, would reduce speed, would, would reduce the need for police enforcement, would promote conditions which enhance the community environment, including pedestrians, cycle, cyclists, and transit use, would reduce vehicle speeds without impacting vehicle volume or movement. And we were talking about the cost of this. Um, in an email from Tom McArdle in back in 2017, that's when I started talking about the need for repavement. I wasn't even bringing up speed bumps then. He told me that Cumming Street had most recently been paved in 1992. That's 32 years ago. He also told me the street condition had been assessed and was awarded a score of 50 out of 100. He offered at that time in 2017, Cumming Street, quote, was overdue for substantial maintenance. I would argue that whatever cost might be associated with adding two, maybe at most three speed bumps can be offset by the savings the city has realized by delay and deferment of maintenance of Cumming Street. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that. I'll, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thanks, Jeannie. Adrian. So, I mean, it sounds like this situation has been going on for at least four, seven years. So at this point, there's been data, there's been complaints. We have, you know, we have records of issues that are happening in this neighborhood and we do have a policy and a process to go through. Is that necessary at that, at this point to go through this process of getting speed bumps when there has been documented issues on this street for many, many years. And in addition to speed bumps, it looks like there's other issues happening in this area. So, layering in other services, police, patrol, what can we do as a city to ensure that this neighborhood is safe, our families are safe, our children are safe, our animals are safe? Like, what does that look like for us as a city? And what can we do now to protect them instead of going through a process that they've been trying to go through for six years? I think, I think it's something we really need to think about and the bureaucracy at this point, I think we just, my opinion is they've had enough, they've collected enough data, let's try to solution at this point. Well, it's our policy, we can we can take other action if we want, Tim and then Sal. I was just gonna suggest, this is agenda item eight out of 20 something agenda items tonight. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to make a motion so we can vote and keep moving, <laughs> please? So let's see what the motion would be. 
Let's take a look. So we have a policy. While you're looking, I do just want to respond a little bit because I think it's important not only for folks here that are attending, but people. Uh, the reason there's a, a vote uh, part of that, I, I certainly understand the concern that that was raised, is that uh, in national studies of traffic calming, if there's not a substantial support in a neighborhood for it, they fail. And what that looks like is they get put in and then other people who hadn't been consulted, hadn't had a say in it, then come in and complain and the towns and cities end up taking them out. You know, we didn't want speed bumps. Why did you put it in? Why weren't? And so this policy, I think, was intended to match the national data that said you've got to get buy-in at the beginning. So, you know, it's not just a popular vote. It's to have an effective process. So I'm not saying you have to follow it, but someone said shouldn't just be decided by popular vote. And I, I do think safety shouldn't be divided. I agree with that statement. The, the reason is that there is national data on traffic calming, particularly and its acceptance in neighborhoods. So well, Adrian is ruminating on a motion. Um, does the city have experience with speed bumps elsewhere? I mean, I know there were some in the meadow. And yeah, so the only place I, I I will defer to DPW on this, Kurt. I see Kurt's hand up, so maybe he can answer that. Kurt, why don't you go ahead and answer that? Yep. Hi, this is Kurt Monica, Public Works Director. Um, so, yes, the meadow is the only area, I believe, that we do have. Um, they're called speed tables, so it's kind of a long, um, kind of gradual bump rather than the small, sort of the ones that we we're talking about as temporary. Um but I, I also, the reason I raised my hand is um, the estimated cost, I think, for a speed table, which um, maybe is the appropriate uh, measure for this street, uh, is about $10,000 per table. So um, if we're going to approve this, uh, there could be an impact on the overall paving budget. It's somewhere between five dollars to $10,000 per table. We don't know until we get, you know, you know unless we bid it out. So I, I just want to have council recognize that there is a financial impact and that we may have to adjust our paving plan because this is not a budgeted item. Um, and the other, the other piece I wanted to know is without, you know, collecting the data post post resurfacing of the street, um, we don't really know the correct spacing for those. So we don't really know how to design them. So if there's going to be a motion to put these in, um, you know, I'd ask council how to identify how we fund it and and how we go about um, you know designing it without without having the data that we need to do it you know uh, to standards. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, can I yeah. just follow up, Kurt? I was curious about the effectiveness of the speed tables in the meadow. Uh, those are put in a, a really long time ago, so I. You know, I wasn't directly involved. Um, you know, I I expect that they do that they are effective, um, but I, I again I wasn't um, involved in that process. It was kind of before my time. Um, Councillor Gill, do you have a thought? Cannot think of a motion. I'm looking at your flow the flow chart in this process and. It says collect data, MTIC defines the area impacted, initial neighborhood support survey, neighborhood meeting, traffic calming plan design, initial temporary traffic measure controls, neighborhood survey for plan support, plan approval by city council, construction of approved plan. So that's the flow chart of the process. But it sounds like you want to pave the road, collect data on the paved road before collecting more data. Like well, I'm just let me make a suggestion. Yeah. You know, I'm I don't own this uh, motion, but uh, I I think what you're getting at is that you would like to waive this policy and direct the uh, Department of Public Works to install uh, up to two uh, speed tables um, in in the current paving season. And so I think the motion would be direct the you know, one waive the policy to direct the installation of two uh, speed table up to two speed tables and three have that be based on uh, 
traffic studies, traffic data collected after the road is paved. That's what I think you're getting at, but uh, I'm not. Don't want to put words in your mouth. Right. I'm wondering if you could make an amendment to that and use the data that has been collected. Me. Who's who's speaking? Oh, sorry, this is Sierra Lowell. Okay, I think would you, oh, Sierra, would you please hold off? Um, I just recognized Councillor Hurl to speak. So um, you will have a chance to speak, and there's someone in the room who'd also like to address the council. Um, so we'll go through that process. Lauren. I'm just wondering about, like, to Kurt's point about having a budget plan, having like if we could ask city staff to come back with a plan that's an expedited process with an expectation that based on what we know, the plan is to install speed tables, you know, unless we learn something that blows our mind, that is different than we realize, or there's some other solution that's better. Um, but like to come back with a plan for how we would fund this and how we can have an expedited process to move this forward this paving season. Is that a motion? That is a motion. Okay. So the, the motion is to direct city direct, yeah, city, direct city staff to. Okay. Uh, so direct motion? city staff to come back with a proposed plan for how we would fund and expedite implementation of speed tables on coming street. Yeah. In the current paves, paving in, season. In the current paving season. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second. Okay, uh, we've got a couple of people that I hear from. Mr. Whitaker first, then Sierra Lowell. Just wanted to thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, first, the point of process, the front doors are locked and there's no sign saying if you want to join city council meeting. Uh, it wasn't locked when I got in, came in the front door, but they've been locked when I went out to get a clock. Um, so I think you're in open meeting violation. Um, I think we need to consider the impacts on snow plowing. I, I'm I'm fully supportive of safety and the and the predicament that these residents and safety and children create. But I I feel like this planning window seven years now. I feel like it's the way we put in public bathrooms too. It's pathetic. Uh, I think you, if you're planning to pave the street, you could pave the street without committing the $20,000 to the speed tables, which might create plowing hazards. And we don't know where to put them exactly. Uh, we could try some other uh, removable uh, obstacles like Lauren mentioned, uh, calming strategies uh, this year and work possibly no more on where and whether to put the speed tables in next year. Um, but the idea that snow plows are going to rip these things up uh, is a concern. I also think we ought to, these are behavioral issues for a certain small subset of the population. And it's the same folks that are speeding up and down Main Street, you know, and the pretext that we arrest a legislator for a loud muffler or stop a legislator for a loud muffler. You know, we should be stopping people who are racing up and down Main Street and rolling coal, I think it's called, where you push out as much diesel smoke as you can. So I, I would like to see an emphasis on enforcement. I think we should experiment with some speed cameras, uh, if possible, to find out who are these. It's probably only a handful of people who are terrorizing this street, you know, and those could be lessons learned that would apply in other problem areas. I think if you turn up your enforcement, we may not waste lots of $10,000 bills. Um, thanks. Th thanks, Steve. Uh, Seattle, oh, and we'll... the other thing is that you let somebody spot for way beyond three minutes earlier on, on the video, and I take protest of the disparate treatment. Thank you, Steve. Sierra Lowell, are you still asking to be recognized? Yes, thank you. Sorry for uh, jumping in there. I thought we were at the motion. Um, I just want to point out in the 
process that has been proposed and accepted for traffic calming, the holdup here has been the fact that Cumming Street has the funds for paving in Montpelier has been delayed um, fiscal year after fiscal year. And the way the process is set up, the workflow chart, we, do could we can um, consider or is it necessary that the data be collected on a paved street? That, you, you know, the, the workflow chart is based on a municipality street already being paved. We're not in that situation, and um, we're trying to be efficient and move forward with installing a traffic calming solution. And we're bringing it to the attention of the city council, which my understanding is after the process, it is up to city council to approve this final. Um, it's not up to the uh, transportation, the uh, Department of Public Works, which potentially that's where it was previous to, the, to this workflow chart. Um, I do wanna bring up the most recent incident, uh, which demonstrates again, how narrow of a street Again, a uh, truck coming over the bridge and going around the 90 degree turn uh, was attempting to drift and within 40 feet of the 90 degree turn, fishtailed and accelerated to such high speeds that when they crashed into the telephone pole, which is at the end of my driveway at my front yard where my child and my dog and myself often frequent, splintered the telephone pole in half and was only suspended. It didn't fall over because it was being suspended by a wire. These are the speeds that we're talking about. Now it has also been pointed out that we need more enforcement, presence of enforcement. The Montpelier Police Department, they are not babysitters. They are quick to respond to telephone calls and they have done their due diligence and put in the monitoring systems to collect the data, one um, over the bridge and then again on the speed uh, straight away. So you actually have some comparable data because the bridge and the first portion of the street is paved versus non-paved. So I'm asking the city council um, to consider and and if they will consider bypassing the process because the um, street is not paved. If, if this had been considered previously and, and maybe there needs to be a separate process for unpaved streets, where we, we, where we would be in the process right now is the um, Department of Public Works would have already initiated the surveys to all of the residents, and we'd now be discussing whether or not to install these. But because of the delay in the budget from fiscal year to fiscal year about just paving, we haven't been able to move forward in the process. And I think that should be taken into consideration. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Sierra. Um, Carrie. Thanks. I wanted to speak to the motion. Um, I think it's pretty clear that there's a problem that needs to be solved here. And I'm, I think it's a great idea to try to come up with an expedited, expedited process for doing so. Um, I, I don't want us to bypass any of the key elements of the process, however. So I I will vote for this motion, but with the understanding that all the pieces still need to happen, um, including the public the public input. I think I think that's a that's absolutely essential. We can't just skip over that. Um, same with the data collection, and that could 
we've got a lot of data already. I think that you know DPW could factor all in everything that we've heard already and what we already know that doesn't have to start from scratch. But so I just wanted to make the, make it clear that I do think the process that we have outlined is a very, very good process. And I would like to follow it as closely as possible. But if there's a way to do it quickly within this budget year, I'm all for it. And I would love to see a plan from DPW about how to do that. Thanks, Carrie. Kurt. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have a, a suggestion for consideration uh, by council. Um, so, you know, we, uh, Corey and I do believe that the traffic patterns, the, the speed at which uh, people are going to be traveling on the road is going to change likely significantly once the road is paved, right? Once it's smooth. And we see that on any street we pave. And so uh, the design of the permanent measures um, will be different from that, from data collected post pavement versus um, the current condition or even the condition of the pavement. Um, before we removed it and turned it to gravel. Uh, so my suggestion is that um, we uh, purchase, DPW purchase and install temporary speed bumps for this summer, um, removable. Um, and we kind of, uh, we manage traffic calming uh, post pavement. So the paving beds are already out. And um, if we we're gonna add this into the contract, it'd be by change order. So it would not be part of the bid. Um, so I would suggest uh, that we put in temporary uh, speed bumps removable for the summer, and then this winter we collect traffic data and develop a plan um, for permanent measures. That's my suggestion to council. Thanks, Kurt. Lauren. I, I consider Kurt's idea a friendly amendment. <laughs> um, I, so I would, can I amend my proposal well, or what should we do? The clerk and I were just discussing the fact that there's no such thing as a friendly amendment under Robert's rules. I love that phrase, though. So, yes, but you can move to amend your uh, your Sorry. motion. Uh, I move to amend my motion um, to um, direct city staff to install temporary traffic calming measures this summer and then go through the long-term practice for a permanent solution. Oncoming okay. street. And is there a second to that motion? Second. Is there any further discussion of that motion? Is this a motion to amend the uh, the base motion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so now we're to the main motion, which is the motion as you've just amended it. Is there any further discussion of that motion? If not, yeah, can okay. I ask a question? Um, excuse me. Yes, very briefly. <clears throat> can Kurt speak to how a temporary speed bump compares to a permanent one in terms of the height and uh, effectiveness of the two? Kurt, do you have an answer? <laughs> Well, Corey is more the expert uh, on this than I am. Um, but, you know, the generally the temporary speed bumps are more of a drastic, uh, you know, bump. So they're probably going to be uh, more uh, impactful for speeders than a permanent speed table. Um, but, you know, I think they, they both sort of have the same same effect. It's just a shorter distance with a bigger jolt on the temporary measures as opposed to, um, you know, a kind of a, a longer drawn out sort of um, impact uh -huh. to, to vehicles. Thanks, Kurt. All right. All those in favor of the motion. Can you please state the motion just to be clear? Uh, I have moved to amend the motion to, oh, this is already done. So the motion is now to direct city staff to install temporary traffic calming measures this summer and go through the long-term process to find a permanent solution. Thanks. All right. Are you ready for that vote? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We have adopted, uh, passed the motion. Thanks, folks. And it is now 8.38. It is time for our 10-minute 8.30 break. We'll be back here at approximately 8.48. All right, I will call us back to order.
And we are next up have Montpelier Alive update with our esteemed director of Montpelier Alive. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right. I know how to use a mic. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to keep this brief, a little fun, some nice pictures, but also um, just help council understand what some of our upcoming projects are um, and also talk a little bit about the DID fund. Um, I've only done this a couple times, still new in the seat, but hopefully um, this information will be helpful to all of you. So the first half is a little update on- Let me just- Yep. Could you start out by telling everybody who you are? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I'm Katie Trouts, the executive director of Montpelier Alive. I came on February, 2023, and um, but I've been with the organization for a couple years prior uh, as the event coordinator. Um, so this first half I was saying is going to be a little bit of just an overview and an update and the second half will be the DID um, proposal. The arrows are not working. Okay, there we go. All right, this is downtown. I just want you to take note <laughs> of uh, how full the downtown looks. This is a downtown Taste of Montpelier Festival, I believe, uh, this shot was taken. Um, but, you know, people are talking about the health of the downtown, and I just wanted to know what it looks like on a really good day. And we hope to see many of those this summer. You know all about Montpelier Live, I'm sure, but I will just um, speak a little bit about what some of our focuses are. Um, Montpelier Live focuses on uh, events and uh, bringing vibrancy to our downtown. Um, we host 10 plus events annually, um, also through our downtown event grant program, which we'll talk about later. And um, right now we're pre prepping for our annual July 3rd event. Uh, we did some research on this and we know that it attracts around 19,000 visitors each year. Um, and this year, coming right up, we have a wonderful web page that shows the schedule of events. Please check that out. It's right around the corner. Um, Taste of Montpelier in September, Moonlight Magic, Flannel Friday, and Mayfest are kind of our staple events, uh, but we often will experiment with other events throughout the year. Uh, we work on downtown beautification efforts, um, and uh, that comes in the shape of flower baskets across town and barrels with the wonderful help of Lynn Seats, who has been a Montpelier Live volunteer for a very long time. Just want to take the opportunity to thank her for her hard work. Um, holiday decorations, many of those were washed away in the flood, but we had um, wreaths and the glowing snowflakes uh, across the, across the, uh, the street. Um, we're focusing more on illumination these coming years, but definitely uh, the garlands and, and all of that. That's Montpelier Live's work. Um, and public art, such as those colorful M benches that you might have seen uh, down on the Rialto um, and many murals across town. We just like to bring a little splash of color, um, making our downtown more attractive. Um, we work in marketing, as you know. Um, our latest project was the Adventure website uh, that was branding our city as uh, 
an all around adventure location where you could access the great outdoors from our downtown and then back to downtown for, you know, dinner or a drink after a long mountain bike ride. Um, so we'll talk more about that adventure site, but we also do brochures for Montpelier and we take calls from visitors. Um, and our website is a main resource for tourism and visitors to Montpelier. Economic vitality, uh, supporting businesses. And we all know what that looks like. Um, in addition to providing professional development opportunities and trying to fill empty storefronts and vacancies across town, we um, help in uh, times of need and crisis. Uh, both COVID and and the flood were opportunities for us to step in and, and support our economic vitality downtown. We helped businesses reopen safely and confidently. Um, we granted over $2 million to over 125 businesses in downtown Montpelier, um, providing resources for all. Um, these were impactful projects of the last year. Um, I was speaking about the All Adventure, All Around Adventure website, which you should check out if you haven't already, adventure.montpelieralive.com, although you can get there from our website when you click on Outdoor Rec. Um, we are uplifting this site. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, we know that there's a lot of potential here for uh, being an economic driver for our downtown to focus on this access to the outdoors and outdoor rec. Um, and we're working with the city parks department on some of those activities, those branding activities. Another impactful project that we were kind of surprised to see the outcomes um, and the positivity um, and, uh, and the great impact of is the illumination projects that we started working on last year. This is a picture of the Langdon Street Bridge, um, which during a time when Langdon Street uh, was basically under construction still from flooding and businesses felt like it was very hard to attract people there. Um, and it was the darkest time of year. The street felt a little unsafe and dirty. Uh, we lit up this bridge and all the businesses on that road will attest to the fact that it did in fact bring people uh, to their area. It made everybody feel happier and um, was a main attraction when people came to visit the city. You could notice it from both sides on the North Branch. Um, so this was kind of a pilot project for something we have in mind for the future. Um, you probably are very aware of uh, what we worked on during flood, the flood and our recovery and resilience efforts, but here's a very quick overview. Um, we were a participant in developing the volunteer hub with the city parks director, Alec Ellsworth, Peter Walk, and um, of course, I wanna acknowledge fire department, Bob Gowans, um, MPD, DPW, city management, city council, everybody did what they could here. Um, and the volunteer hub was a pretty extraordinary um, thing that we all we all contributed to. Uh, we also provided resources for businesses and community um, on a web page that became the go-to place for people to find what they needed and links to more information. Um, Fundraising and granting, I spoke about that, uh, raising over $2.6 million and made 150 grants um, to recovering businesses to get them back on their feet. Uh, and we did the last grant round for that in January of 2024, actually. That was a third grant round. Trying to fill those gaps when the businesses needed it the most. And resilience, we continue to stay engaged um, with the Commission for Recovery and Resilience. I, Montpelier Live, myself, um, are a partner and uh, I attend the meetings uh, each time and I work closely with John Copans to discuss some of the issues that our downtown faces and think of um, creative solutions uh, and hopefully acting as a, a voice to share the thoughts and feelings and opinions of the downtown business community. I did wanna share this with you as well. I will send it out over email. 
Um, but I thought that everybody would be interested in seeing these survey results that may inform some of our next work collectively together. Um, we did a business survey recently and over 30 businesses responded. Um, and here were some of the general thoughts. I will send you a much more detailed view of this. Um, but in summary, uh, they thought Montpelier Life should continue doing all the things that we are doing um, and including more support uh, and professional development opportunities, increasing that aspect of what we do. Um, downtown improvements that they recommended would be more investment in infrastructure, um, more efforts to attract tourists, lower property taxes, better signage, uh, cleaner streets, better parking. You hear from them, you know, you know these things, but um, it was just interesting to get some collective opinion about what could be improved in the downtown. Um, main challenges they uh, commented on were the lack of foot traffic, uh, costs of doing business and living in Montpelier. Aligned with some of the things that, that we know and, and have heard already, um, but other comments, there are some businesses that feel a deep concern about their future in Montpelier, but the overall sense is that most businesses are dedicated to doing business in Montpelier. So that really does say something about their positive feelings about doing business here, that they want to continue that. And I think that's important to note. We did a consumer survey. Over 200 community members responded. I, I think this is pretty good rate for the survey only being out there for just over a week. Um, we still have the survey open. We're going to continue to do surveys. But this one brought back some interesting notes as well. Reasons for coming downtown, um, consumers come downtown for shopping, dining, and events. 55% responded that they like to recreate downtown. That's what draws them downtown. And I thought that was interesting. What does that mean? Well, maybe Onion River Outdoors, some of their events that are centered there. I think there are a lot of community members that participate in those. Top things consumers love about Montpelier, walkability, accessibility, friendliness. We are a welcoming place, I promise. Um, local shops and restaurants. Challenges. These are important to note. Um, almost 50% of people are not say, said that they are not deterred from coming downtown. They'll come anyway. But um, many others said inconsistent open hours for shops and restaurants, lack of parking, poor infrastructure. A lot of coming, a lot of um, comments coming back to infrastructure. I can't see what's behind here. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Let's see what's behind there. Reveal. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's okay. Um, oh, uh, other comments and deterrence. You could see at the very bottom drug use and safety. So that also hit part of this top list. These are these are this is a report I created of the top things that collectively the people in our community spoke about. Um, let's see here. One more page of this. Uh, a couple other things. Um Public improvements were a priority, more business variety, more green space, more parking, and experiences. Uh, people would like to see more live music, a maker space, art classes, a climbing wall, or a gym downtown. A number of people commented on that. Some people think it's important to have a safe space for teens. One idea that came up is a barcade. There's a lot of fun um, data that was gathered from the survey. Again, I'll share that in more depth at another time. Strategic planning projects. We won't go in depth here, but I did want to orient you to how we do our business as Montpelier Alive. We focus on these four points that Main Street America encourages downtown organizations like ours to focus on, and it helps give a better map for doing our work going forward. We focus on our own organization and sustainability, design, beautification, economic vitality, marketing, and tourism. 
So we will continue doing these things. But I wanted to point out our upcoming new projects. You may have heard murmurs about some of these. By the way, this bridge is not in Montpelier, but I wanted to highlight how extraordinary um, some of the illumination projects can be in other places that we admire, like Montreal and Quebec. And this is the Champlain Bridge that goes to Montreal or to that region. Um, new projects include, I have been working really hard um, on getting a welcome center downtown. And I have great news that we've located three potential spots with the state uh, for that to go in on a temporary basis. So near term um, with willingness from the property owners and the state to work on that project together. I will keep you informed. Um, and it's been a really exciting quick turn of events. Um, Advertising campaigns were focusing more on Chittenden County, knowing that Burlington shoppers want to shop in Montpelier more these days. So trying to get us on um, that map a little more and greater reach to Montreal and Boston with ad campaigns. And this is new. We're looking into what it would cost to have a Burlington Airport ad in the Burlington Airport. We noticed we've got Stowe. Um, we've got a couple of other cities, towns in Vermont but we don't have the capital advertised at the Burlington Airport. So um, we are working on securing funding for that project and it's looking really hopeful. And we have a meeting this week to discuss with the airport what that looks like, even just for a year, trying, trying this out. Um, and you may have heard, we recently, Montpelier Alive, received a grant from the state of Vermont um, called the GROW Grant. Uh, and it's, a version of the Think VT relocation program, which used to be the incentive program where the state would pay people to move to Vermont. They've transformed that into finding partners who can help work with them um, on marketing to attract people to, for us, the capital region, um, and conduct outreach to new Montpelierites, new people who settle in this region where Montpelier is the hub, um, to help retain them. So instead of using funding and money for that, they're relying on partners to come up with programs that can support that. And it's the kind of growth that we really hope to see here. I'm not ignoring the fact that housing is an issue. When I talk to, now we're calling them clients or people who want to move here, I tell them about the development projects. I say, you're not going to find a place tomorrow, but you might find a place in a few years. This is what's happening here. So it's also a great way to um, kind of get some of those projects out there and the potential that Montpelier has to, to grow. Um, so that will boost our marketing efforts. That's really the main idea here. We're very excited to have that funding for Montpelier. Um, bridge illumination. So this is the other big project that we're working on. This sounded like a small idea but we saw with the Langdon Street project that it was really impactful. And um, with the help of Vivian Tomasi, who is our project coordinator for that, um, we have raised over $100,000 to light the seven bridges in our downtown, four on the Winooski, three on the North Branch River. That's a seasonal lighting project. We're gonna see how it goes this winter. We think that this could be really exciting for putting Montpelier on the map as a destination. Um, these bridge lights can be color. They can be white. They can be anything we want them to be. And we're working really closely with a company to find the right look and feel for our town. And it's all changeable. So that's what we're doing this winter. We're thinking about and we may have the opportunity to move that into a more permanent realm. And we've been engaging with the city on our seasonal lighting thus far. And we really look forward to engaging with all the council members to talk about what that permanent lighting would look like. Doesn't mean the lights are on all the time. It means we could have light during events. You know, July, we'd have red, white, and blue on the Winooski River, some of the truss bridges. Um, just imagine that Montpelier could become the city of bridges and it would really set us apart from any other place in the state. And um, for people outside of the state, it would put Montpelier on the map. 
I think this could be really transformational and we will certainly keep you updated as that evolves. And you will see the bridges lit up this winter because we achieved our goal to do that on a seasonal basis. Um, with all of that said, this is an outline of how we used our funding or what the funding was um, in the previous year and what it will be looking like going forward. This is DID funding. Montpelier Alive has a number of revenue streams. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, but this funding is the um, pilot and the local tax funding. That total is the 60,091. That has been the same for three or four years at the least. That's the data I have from when I entered this position. Last year for marketing, we spent 30,500. This year, I'm looking at 29,500. We have a lot of marketing support from these grants that we have received. Um, but I wanna focus that for the DID on a broader reach to Boston, Quebec. This is ad campaigns and media, media partners and the website redesign for better navigation for visitors. And we're putting our website in French uh, not just in French, but having the option, <laughs> having the option of um, of it being in French language, which I think will be really beneficial for attracting Quebecers. Um, so the marketing comes down just a little bit, and then for beautification in twenty uh, in the last year, uh, it was twenty four twenty four thousand five hundred, and for this upcoming, we pr pr propose 25,500. And this would go towards some of these projects I outlined, the bridge illumination and other holiday decor to expand our garlands um, across to the Bailey Bridge, um, Bailey Ave Bridge, and the lighting there. And also expanding our flowers and planting this year, we were able to do Main Street and I think that's been a really nice welcoming, um, a, a way to welcome visitors into our town through the gateway on Main Street um, and other streetscape improvements I'll outline in a minute. And then our grants, we want the same from, from last year to this year, it's 5,000. And then we supplement that from Montpelier Live with another 5,000 to support at least 10 events um, through our downtown event grant program. So not just our events, but other people who want to do events, uh, we always support through these grants. This is historically how the DID has worked. I haven't changed very much. I just um, adjusted the numbers a little bit according to the projects that we foresee. You don't have to look at all these numbers. Just on the far right, you'll see this, this is the proposal for fiscal year 2025, and I put in red those areas of extra focus and moving the funds from one thing to the next. Every year, it looks just slightly different in these columns, but they add up to the same 60091 so it's just moving the money around a little bit. There's the broader reach, the French language option, and navigation upgrades for our website, and then streetscape um, holidays, flowers, and the streetscape and public art can mean a number of things. Benches, trash bins, art. I really like to fuse the two, meet the community need with an artistic project. So, um, those are our DID numbers. And lastly, of course, I want to thank the council for your ongoing support. Um, I am loving this job. I'm loving this partnership with the city, and I think it's only gotten stronger after the flood, um, finding ways to work together and, and meet that community need. I have a few um, things I'd love for the council to consider going forward, whether it's this year or next year. Um, but generally, I noticed that, uh, and this is not for a vote, this is just for your considerations. Um, an increase in the budget line to accommodate rising costs. And we obtain uh, money funds from um, in the budget every year outside of the DID. But I just want it to be noted that that also hasn't changed in a number of years, but our costs are rising 
to do events, to do everything we do, um, just like every other budget line. So we can come up with a plan for that. Um, I would love to have council or have the city continue to invest in infrastructure and street statescape improvements um, and continued investment, marketing and tourism and our events, investing in regional and local flood mitigation projects and continue to partner um, on economic development projects in all the ways that Montpelier Alive can using our strengths. Thank you for listening to the presentation and um, for, again, your support uh, for all that we've been doing this year. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. So, I just make a procedural comment before we... So just all you all know, the Downtown Improvement District, the DID Fund, is a tax surcharge on commercial buildings in the designated downtown. So it's voted on by the voters every year. And so, and because it's a higher rate, and the state buildings are in, it increases their pilot payment toward this as well. So that's what the, the total is here. But because it's a tax revenue that we collect and pass, you have to appropriate the money. So we don't, we, they set their own budget, they do everything, but this one piece, you have to approve the expenditure of the DID. So it would be appropriate when you get to it to make a motion in a second and vote to approve the budget. And that is the next item on the agenda. So yeah. We oh right I we know everything. To yep, we I think we know everything we need to know to take that up at this yes. point. So any, Lauren, I think you were raising your hand. First of all, thank you. You do so much to make our community better. Super grateful and exciting to see the new projects and everything coming. Um, and one thought, even we've already given an assignment earlier tonight, but I wonder about at some point if the city's new grant committee could be an asset for you. I mean, you do so much with uh, not that much staff, so uh, maybe we could tap into some community resources to help also be looking at, you know, the, the city investment, and then also are there ways that we could help with grant writing potentially also. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and yeah, just thank you. And I mean, I'm happy to just make a motion that we adopt the um, DID proposal as offered by Montpelier Alive. Is that the well, I Is suggest that we or hold we that at... just because we're not at that, that oh, item okay, on the can't. agenda. Uh, we can do it quickly. But okay. <laughs> any any other comments or questions from the council about uh, the Montpelier Alive presentation? Any questions or comments from members of the public? Steve. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Before you, Pellin's got her hand up. We'll take her first. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation. And I am the uh, council representative in the Montpelier Ally Board. And I also want to thank them. Uh, they are all volunteer and they are really doing great job uh, to support um, all the efforts we are doing as a city. So I have heard a couple uh, questions from different people if Montpelier Alive can create some kind of platform for people who are looking for a job at downtown and the businesses who are looking for employees. Is there any plan or is it possible to do? Thank you. Shall I just answer? Yeah. I love that question because I can say yes. <laughs> that is a part of this GROW grant is housing a section of our website that can address the needs of new residents. And a part of that will be a jobs board. Um, and we are working with other uh, employers uh, to partner on various projects that can all be a part of this web page. And I think, I think that's kind of what you're talking about. Thanks. Thank okay. you. And that is that all you had, Palin? Okay, thanks. Steve. Uh, thanks, Steve Whitaker. I noticed on the priorities, the survey priorities, uh, that Katie skipped over uh, restrooms. I noticed public restrooms on that list, and it didn't get a mention. Uh, but I've mentioned earlier Wi-Fi. I, we have hikers, we have bikers that come and they buy burgers and beer, but they would sure love to shower before they go out to our restaurants. And probably the other restaurant patrons would like that too. So 
I just think that if we've had a toilets committee and a homelessness task force for five years and not accomplished any of that, I would like to see Montpelier Alive have more latitude and direction and support, including financial support, to get this job done. These restrooms are not just for the unhoused. These restrooms are for our citizens, our mothers with children, our old people and incontinent people, et cetera. And we're just really missing the boat to have, you know, ripped down every shelter and info booth that the homeless use and, and still not even put in restrooms. So I, I think that this is an opportunity to uh, both do do right by the business community and do right by the citizens, including the unhoused citizens. And I would encourage you to, uh, I, I am curious who paid, was that you, Montpelier Live money that paid for that expensive new electric service on the Langdon Street Bridge and the Main Street Bridge? Those are, are, there, are we also investing city funds in putting electrical? Because there's a whole bunch of new electrical and meter sockets and stuff. And I was an electrician, so I know what that stuff costs. So I'm surprised you're getting a good deal on it at the prices mm -hmm. you're quoting. We've been working closely with the city on the infrastructure uh, improvements to be able to do the bridge lighting projects. Uh, so it's been it's been both supporting Montpelier Alive and and the city supporting the infrastructure upgrades. So did we have a line item that we voted the city money to be spent on that? Montpelier Alive raised the money for that. Okay. All right. So that's, I just don't want to, uh, I don't want money hidden in the budget. I like, I like things transparent. So thanks. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Katie, I think we'll move to the next agenda item, um, which is the downtown improvement Dis district budget. Now you want to make your motion. Um, I move we adopt the downtown improvement district budget as proposed. Is there a second? Second. We we still have Katie here, so if there are any questions about that, we can ask her. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Katie, for coming in. All right, next up we have the item, uh, Councillor Cohn's proposal for a youth committee. Uh, Palin, do you want to take it away? Yeah, thank you. Um, so it was very good to hear a couple times that different uh, people during their um, talk or presentation mentioned about youth and uh, how their ideas are important, even like uh, Montpelier Alive uh, presentation, I heard that you'd wanted to have something for them uh, downtown. So uh, I think it's a good coincidence that we are talking about uh, creation of youth committee. So uh, we most of the time talk about day-to-day -day, uh, initiatives, but also most of the things we approve related with our city's future and youth is our future. So that's why um, I want to propose to create a youth committee as one of the city committees, uh, but this committee will have uh, all members from middle school and high school students, and they will um, give insights on uh, city projects, and they will also talk about their vision, what they want to see in our uh, town. Um, so youth still can uh, serve in different city committees, uh, but this uh, committee will be uh, helping them uh, to be part of the decision-making process. And by this way, uh, we can create more inclusive local governance. And uh, if uh, we have this youth committee, all the members uh, who will be experienced in local governments, they can also um, educate their peers and also maybe in the future they might be interested in running uh, for the seats. Um, so I think it's a brief summary and all the details um, are um, you know, uh, listed uh, in the proposal. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has. Thanks, Bella. How could we say no? <laughs> <laughs> 
Any anything from the council? I think it merits bringing it back to Palin earlier. So this committee, the initial setup is that it wouldn't require staff support. At least that's my understanding of the way this would be set up. So um, just is, is a, I think Palin will be involved in I guess maybe possibly another council member is what she's seeking to do it. But because, um, you know, staff, there's a lot, we're asking a lot of staff. And I think if she's able to set this up and, and not add an additional burden, at least this year, that would be good. Thanks, Tim. I think I think it's a valid question. I think there are certain things, administrative things that have to be done that probably will involve some staff support. Um, posting uh, the uh, agendas, uh, posting minutes, um, but it doesn't have to be that much. Yeah, because we have close to thirty committees right now. This will yeah. this and the grants committee puts us up to like thirty two. So I think it's something to be mindful of as we look at our structure. Yep. Bill, did you have any thoughts about it? Okay. No, I, I had talked with Palin about this as well. And we, you know, same thing that we didn't really have staff other than the postings and, you know, the, those kind of things that we could devote to that, you know, see how this evolves over the future. I did volunteer that it, staff members may be interested or willing to meet with this committee. Like I know I would go and to describe how different forms of local government and just how it works and how ours works and the structure and, you know, police chief might go to talk to them about what the police department does and give them a tour or, you know, different people might be willing to do that. But as far as an ongoing staff person, we can't really devote that right now. We are pretty, pretty much at max. I would happily go talk about what we do here at the, at the council. I think there'd be a lot of support. So the mayor will be the staff person. That's what I heard. <laughs> Lauren. Yeah, I, I think this is great. Hopefully there's interest from enough youth to do it. My two thoughts would be, um, one, if we're pursuing it, trying to get really crystal clear on what the goals and outcomes that we're looking for. The city committees that I've been on that have struggled the most have had kind of either like really big or really vague missions like the social and economic justice committee, it was like so broad, like um, that we spent a lot of time talking about like, what what's our purview and what should we be doing? And so just to try to make it a really targeted, you know, maybe there's even some specific projects like a youth center or like something tangible and then also providing input or something. But like, I would just recommend that we try to give them a really actionable mission and goals um, and timelines. The other piece that's kind of tied to that is I've, um, for example, worked with a number of youth who are appointed to like the the state's climate council as the youth representative, and they have expressed frustration and challenges that they feel like they're spending a lot of time but don't actually really have a voice and there's not really an outcome that they see. So again, just to the point of like, if they're developing something that is coming to us that we can act on. And so that it feels like an empowering process that they leave feeling really good and not just like something they spin their wheels or they write some report that we, you know, say thank you and put on a shelf or something. So just just trying to be really thoughtful about how we structure it so it can actually be successful and a good great experience for the kids would be my thoughts. Okay. So Lauren, just following up on that, are you thinking that? we would want to do more work on this before we move and approve the proposal that is in our agenda tonight? Well, it looks like the proposal was to kind of come back with a working with staff over the summer to develop a structure. And I know there's kind of some goals laid out, um, but it says to, to kind of just develop the mission over the summer. So. I don't know that, you know, maybe it could even be like a consent agenda thing, you know, and then we could like pull it off if it feels like it's, if the staff and Palin working together or whatever, if it feels like it needs some more work, but I would be fine with something like that. I, I just was making a suggestion about how that gets developed more than anything else. Okay. So, I mean, I'd be fine approving, I mean, I want to let, Palin, move it or whatever, but uh, Palin. 
Yeah, thank you, Lauren. It's a good point. Uh, that's why, you know, I heard this uh, recommendation from um, several people. Uh, so I put that timeline and working with the city staff. Uh, and before, you know, announcing and trying to attract youth, we will have a very um, clear structure. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Carrie? Took your hand down. Okay. Okay. So is there a motion to approve this or do we want to just say, okay, start working on this and come back to us with something concrete? Harry. Oh, you're still muted. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm, I move that we direct the city staff to come up with a plan for creating this committee, including a very clear um, purpose and goals. Is there a second? Was that, was that in conjunction with Council Member Cohn? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> moved by uh, Carrie, second I, by can I say Gordon, something? Uh, Palin, yes. Uh, so, um, again, it is in the plan to work with city staff to create some structure, but it is important youth should also have a say in that structure, too. So when we talk about clear structure, I think it will be clear enough to create a framework, uh, but please, you know, um, be aware that uh, this committee's members can, you know, change or might want to see something else. So I hope it is okay with the council members. Okay. Yeah, I heard Lauren second it. Yeah. Yeah, Carolyn, I agree with that. Anybody else ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Next step down the road for this. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you. We're now up to item 12, district heat budget and rates. And we have our exploding finance director here. Before Evelyn pulls it up, if the same presentation is in your packet, I'm happy to give it to you. I can also give you a quick Cliff Notes version without it. Um, it is the same budget as last year. There is no increase in the rates. They are the exact same rates and the exact same capacity charges as the prior year. Uh, we were unable to do a capacity study this year, so there was no way to reallocate. We are working um, really diligently to get the fiber system back up and functioning so that we can collect that data in the FY25 heating system, uh, excuse me, season and reallocate for 26. Um, that's the Cliff Notes version. I can walk through the whole presentation very similar to last year's um, and not a lot straying from the packet. Uh, and I can also read you the last slide that has the recommended action, if that would be helpful. Well, let me, um, I, I just, I, I, I really appreciate the Cliff Notes version of this. Um, one of the thoughts I have is that uh, you're, you're confident that without any increases, you know, the budget that we have now is sufficient to uh, to meet the needs. Yeah, so we reviewed the budget thoroughly. Um, I've adjusted it based on the agreement from the state and any other needs we have, and we felt that we could do that within the budget structure um, with no increase, aside from the fact that there's the accounting discrepancy with depreciation, and this fund is always operating at an accounting loss. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody, any members of the council have any comments or questions? Uh, including delving as as deeply or as not as as you need to
rates for 2025. Do you want me to read them it, or? You... Yeah. It's it's on the is thing. That, it's, oh, here it is. Okay, sorry. It, so you want me to just read it from the what you wrote? Yes, please. <laughs> Otherwise, she'll be Okay, recommended action is to approve the district heat Montpelier budget in the amount of $689,589 and establish a district heat capacity rate of $6.90 per MBTUH and the energy rate of $15.65 per MMBTU um, for fiscal year 2025. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? It looks like you. I would just say that experience has taught me to trust Sarah's accounting um, on all of this. And I appreciate the Cliff Notes version as well. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Didn't know you were going to have such an easy night, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I am looking at the time now. It is 9.35. Um, the thing that I really want to make sure we uh, complete is to adopt the strategic plan. So I'm going to suggest we move that up. Um, and then see if we still have time for some of the other uh, action items. So, Kelly, is that you? Well, she's coming up. I just say that uh, we had talked about doing this in workshop session, but we have two remote people, so I don't know how well, but I think the intent was to open it up, have public comment and have the council have a discussion if you still want to do it that way. Well, I, I do want to have as uh, free-flowing a discussion as we can. So um, so I think I will start by uh, opening up for opening this up for public comment um, either in the room or on Zoom and and then go from there to uh, discussion within the council. Um, I am not seeing any hands raised. So take it away, Kelly. All right, so I do not have a presentation um, prepared for you tonight. We've gone through all of the goals and initiatives um, over the last several meetings. Um, what I did send along um, was in summary form, um, the detail, and you do have it in the packet from a few meetings ago. Um, it is a little bit small, you can blow it up, um, but in that um, summary, we did include a level of effort. Um, as well as a status and timeline for each of the items. Um, and so I trust that you've received that. I'm happy to go into detail there. Um, additionally, I did include some key performance indicators for each of the goals. Um, so this is just kind of a starting point um, as we move through this next year. Um, the other thing that I do wanna note is that um, with the, st the strategic plan and the draft that we've got in front of you, um, we're moving to um, go through 2027. Um, and so we'll come back to you annually um, to review the plan. Um, and then there are a few other minor changes um, that we picked up as we went through the plan. And so I guess from there, I'd open it up to questions, comments, thoughts. Well, if you could put it up on the screen, um, I know you said it's kind of hard to read because it's small, but Yes. Um, it may take a couple of minutes. Yeah, to if you want to give it. me just a minute, I'll grab it. Yeah. You do it. I think you could probably find yours faster than I could find mine. Yeah, so. you got it.
while you're doing that, let's talk about special meeting dates. Okay, good idea. So uh, jumping to that, we have two special two administrative items that you need to take care of. One is awarding uh, the paving bids. Kurt was hoping to do that as soon as July one. They're out to bid now, and the sooner we can award the bids, the sooner the work can get done. And the second is setting the tax rate, uh, which again is uh, you know a mathematical function. But once we have all the final grand list information, we'll send it out and. We've often done it this way with uh, uh, a remote meeting. Um, so that would be the second one. And I think yours, take off. Okay, well, I think she was hoping for July 9 for that. Um, there may be a third topic I'm gonna talk about under my city manager report, but uh, so I think those would be the dates. We have done those sometimes at noon, but what, four? Five o'clock, so that's better for people. It doesn't take long. Okay, so do you have your calendars out? Do you have a July first? Does that work for people? And Monday. That's a Monday. It's a Tuesday. Right, and we have our regular meeting on the seventeenth. I, I mean, you and I. Oh yeah. Have a regular meeting at at four on Monday. On Monday, so we could if we wanted well, to do it here on the first. Oh okay. But I, I was in YouTube. But <laughs> I'm literally on the road all day, Monday, driving. So the paving bid one, well, okay. Yeah, I it mean, I, I don't... should just be here's the bids. Yeah, here's the who is here's what you know. What about the second? But we won't get the information until the actual meeting. Right? I. Oh, Kurt still on. Would we have it? Or do you, if you're still on, uh, tuning in on this, we're talking about paving bids. When would they expect to get the information about the, the paving bids if we're having a special meeting? Oh, hey, this is Kurt. Um, oh. I, I believe the paving bids are um, are opening this Friday. This Friday. So that so the council would have the that bid information in advance of the first. They wouldn't just be getting it on the first. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. Bye. So, I, I, uh, I mean, if I can't make the actual meeting, and as long need, as we have four, and you need my vote. Yeah, you could contact me, I suppose. But otherwise, yeah. And I, but at least I'll have the data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why don't we set it for the, and is, is noon preferable to people? 12 o'clock and it, these, this tends to take like five minutes. Okay, let's do noon on the first. And maybe you'll be at a point where you can phone in, but maybe Possible. you don't, maybe you yeah. don't even, maybe you can be absent with the, uh, Consent of the council, and we don't even need it. <laughs> and then the ninth is a Tuesday. Um, that's funny. It looks looks like I'm potentially out that day, but uh, oh, I see what I've got on that day. Yeah, I can. I can do it. I suggest doing it. Uh, kind of earlier in the day because I have an event I need to be at uh, like eight or nine. How does that look for people? My name? Tim? Eight or nine. Yeah. Uh, is that okay? Nine's better than the eight for for folks. Given the time, I I get up. We could do it at seven a.m. But I realize most people are not wanting to do it at that hour. Nine o'clock on the ninth. It is. 
Terry and Palin, I'm sorry, I I didn't specifically ask if those times are okay with you. So, yeah, yeah out I just said yes. Okay, They're fine. Great. Yeah, great. Thank you. All Thanks. right. So, um, did you want to take a look at the summary sheet, or did you want to take a look at the plan at, at the whole thing? Let's start with the summary sheet. Okay. And then the the overall plan. And Evelyn, can I share the screen? Okay. Trying to make this a little bit bigger because this is a little a little small and I can't do that. So let's see. I don't know that there is, Steve. I'm sorry. And the answer is that we do not think there is a copy in the room. Yeah, I don't know that this summary is really going to look that great up here, um, to be honest. And Kelly, yeah. are you ready to Super share it? Small. Um, I or certainly can. A point. Yeah, it's it's really small. It's just the way that the formatting is on this. Um. What I can do is pull it up using the Excel version. Um, see if that's a little bit easier to read. Yeah, it's just that the formatting, it's not that great um, to look at this way. Um, so I'm gonna just go with what we've got up here, I guess. Um, is is the is the full one easier to look at because it it wouldn't be in this format? Yeah. So we, the way that it is online is it's in a PDF format, and so it's just it's not the gotcha. format that I would normally view it in. Um, the Excel format is a little bit easier if you wanted to sort, and so that's why the the Excel format is what I would prefer. Um, but it, it's not really in a format that really offers or lends itself to presentation. Um, oh, yeah, I know. I've, yep, I'm doing that. Um, but it's just not. And then this machine doesn't, is limited. Um, so if you're, I can get it as big as I can, but then as you can see, it cuts off. See what I'm saying here? Okay, so what we have. Yeah, I don't know that the summary is, but we can go with it. Um, so how did you want to take this? I mean, I, what we can do is we can go through each of the goals. We can go through the initiatives. We can go through the level of effort. Um, I, I'm not sure where you want to start. Well, I, I would be happy with saying we've gone through everything and it all makes sense to me as, as our strategic plan. And, and but I know there may be other people who may have a different view of that. And so I'd like to hear what other people have to say. And maybe we could go like goal by goal. So our first goal is all under infrastructure. And we have a set of items. Are you going to read them? So, um, just to be clear, um, just for a suggestion. Um, so we've we've already um done the goals, we've done the strategy, and really we'd be looking at the initiatives and action items that are are noted here. Um, just to if if you wanted to go through them, and then I also do have physical copies of the 
um, plan itself. And so that might be the easiest way to do this is just to kind of look at the plan because all of these initiatives have been incorporated into it. And then in terms of looking at level of effort or timing, then we could look at the summary. Okay. Would that work? That? Yeah, let's, yeah do that. let's do that. Okay. You have physical copies for everybody. I do. Uh, great. And then I also have copies of the um, the performance measures too, just to go through those if you wanted to. I'm going to just go ahead and stop my share. Yeah. This just doesn't seem to be it's, it's driving. Not, yep. Not reusable. Yep. No. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Or is it the same as that? Yeah. Yes, just, Lori. Just um want to make sure that for Carrie and Palin, is it clear what documents or do they have these just so they know what we're look, all looking at together? Thanks. Okay, great. So those are on the way to you, Carrie and Palin. Does that mean we have an extra one for Mr. Whitaker? He is welcome to these. Sure. Thank you. Although this is a council work session and we already requested public comment. Yeah, but without having, how do you take comment if you don't have it to mm -hmm. review? And this isn't what you believe it. Oh, I don't think I got that. But... Yeah, so all of this had been sent out for the last meeting because this was on last meeting's agenda, the whole yep. thing. And of course, you've seen every one of them yep. every every meeting since March. Or at least one at a time. One at a time since March, yeah. So, and to... Remind us all and anyone who's watching at home, uh, we've been through a process since uh, since the election of uh, you know, dissecting and examining every element of our uh, strategic plan, um, item by item. And we decided that the way we'd proceed is take uh, you know, discuss and um, take presentations on each of these items. And then from there, reserve the whole thing to the end of this process to uh, adopt the strategic plan as a, as a whole, as a single document. And we have adopted all the goals. Yes, that's correct. Lauren. I just emailed you all. Um, this is like, sorry, wordsmithy that I should have sent before, but um, I just feel like like the first thing people would see is our vision statement. And I feel like that first sentence doesn't read right. Um, so I just proposed a very, like a non-substantive stylistic tweak. Um, so it would read instead, Montpelier is an engaged and growing city with a population that reflects reflects cultural and economic diversity and security for all. And then I had also sent, I thought we had changed this in a previous year, but I guess not like at the second to bottom value statement, instead of saying climate change is real, um, the proposal is just the city must work to actively address climate change through environmental sustainability and resiliency initiatives. Sorry, it's super wordsmithy. No, to <laughs> totally. Like if they you could anything, say, it might just be those. <laughs> you could say it's super wordsmithy, or you could say it's careful and thoughtful. <laughs> do those, do those changes work those, for people? Th those were the only ones I just sent around just to start, just get some wordsmithing out of the way before okay. getting more substance. I got some of that too, actually. <laughs> All right. Um, well, so on the before, wait a minute. 
But let me just ask, are people okay with the changes that Lauren sent in? Right. Okay. And Carrie and Palin, are you with us and okay on that? Thumbs up. Great. Thank you. So that's in Tim. Okay. Um, and we've approved the goals, but word smithy has been bothering me for a bit. And I just how yeah, the rest of you feel, but this, the strategic plan goal for improved public health and safety for all, and then following that in parentheses, we have including the end house. And then it, we also did the same thing in another place later on. I guess the question is, is it really appropriate to single out a group when we're saying for all? Um, so you, you think it's just say for all, yeah. period. Work for people? So that would happen there. And uh, this is, uh... I'm seeing thumbs up on, on the screen. I, I, I think that people wanted to put that in there because they wanted to make sure that everybody knew that we consider our un unhoused people to be members of the community who we're serving them too. But uh, we did the same thing on goal five on page 10 of 12, um, improve public health and safety for all. And then again said, including the unhoused. So there's okay. two places I saw. Great. Um, so I think those are also approved. Everything, everyone's good with that. Okay. Adrian. Just a mod going to stop progress on the strategic plan because it's been going on for a very, very long time. But I think between now and 2027, I would love to see more of a strategic plan template. Um, I know Palin is an expert in this area as well as myself. This is what I do for a living and having some smart goals, which are measurable, achievable, um, really identifying baselines and where we are now where do we want to go and how are we going to get there is a strategic plan and really basing it on some type of data, um, really data driven decisions. And this is, you know, we've gone through this, it's a list of projects, but why these projects, why these projects now, and how are we going to know that they're successful? And I think data is really, really, really important for a strategic plan um, and just have very clear, smart goals so that we know what we're doing, why we're doing it, when we're doing it, who's doing it, and how much does it cost? So you're not saying we should throw this out to do this this year, but what you're saying is that as we develop this into the future, we incorporate those ideas. Can we right? please, yes. For the gotcha. next few years, let's mm -hmm. think about what that might look like. Uh -huh. so, thank you for Great. that consideration. I think to follow that thought, because I we talked about this at our retreat. I mean, this has been a topic for a while to the council. And I, I think one thing I find it, the format is it just keeps coming out in the same format over and over. And it it's a template that I think staff's worked with for a while and maybe are comfortable with, but it's the council really, at least at our retreat, it, I don't think we're comfortable with it. It's not doing what we want it to do. So I think you know, a redo means not this form again. Let's just find a way to make it really work. Um, yeah, I'm not sure whether I agree that the council in general isn't happy with the format, but I think it's I think it's wide open. You know, we definitely can be structuring it in any number of ways. And there's no point in having it structured that doesn't work for people. Right. I'm sure parts of this are useful to the staff, but you know things like infrastructure is are we ever going to have a strategic plan that doesn't include infrastructure? No, so and there are a number of things that happen every year, like implement water line replacement plan and and all of the subheads of that. And yes, you have to tr keep track of that, but if they were, grouped together to the side or 
blanked out or something, it would it would make everything so much more manageable. You know what I mean, to be less to look at. And there's all this stuff that we're we're going to do every year, and we know it's there. We need to be reminded that it's there, but we don't need to we don't need to see it. We don't need to print it out. Um, I mean, it's a small thing, but well, I don't think it's a small thing. I think it's a it's an interesting point that you raise because, and we we talked about this. We sort of talked about this at the uh, at the retreat, and and since then, which. Uh, which is that there are certain activities of city government that are just basic services or, that we have to do. And does that mean it has to be in the strategic plan or another way of putting it, as we talked about the strategic plan sometimes, it's what are the topics that we want to spend our time at the council level to work on or not. And there's some things that we didn't put in the strategic plan because it's just fun basic functions of government. Yeah. But just specifically to that that very specific example about the water line, you know, that was a very high policy priority. You know, we you have now since adopted the 10 year plan. But you know, last year having that plan, figuring out a way to fund it, and now you know, our pursuit of Fund, you know, grant money for that is still an extremely high priority. Sure. So it's, it's, you know, I mean, fixing water lines is kind of something we do, but that big dealing with the backlog and of, of water line was it had been identified as a really high infrastructure goal. So I think, you know, now we've adopted, so it's kind of like still making sure that's at the head of the cost. Now we got to do it. You know, you said, well, yeah. Yeah, sure, and 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 we we can't ignore it, okay. and and maybe we attach some. And at know, some point, that maybe goes into the it. work. Yeah, roads are the same way. You know, we we uh, this year, earlier this year, and every year, we the Department of Public Works is going to come to us, not just saying we're going to pave roads, but here are the roads we're going to do, and and we we approve that. Mm -hmm. Adrian. I'll just give some, you know, kind of building off that, like, you know, some of our goals and our strategies are increase available housing units. So the question in my mind was, well, how many housing units are currently available? What are the opportunities to increase housing units? And then what would be the annual goal for the city to try to strive towards reaching? You know, are we trying to increase those annual or available housing units by 10% each year by 5% each year. Like, what is that goal that we're trying to reach? And then once you dig down, like, then you start talking about the strategies, like who's going to do that? What is the plan? Like, those are the work plans that kind of get into like the, the, the staff's work. But how do we know that we're achieving that increase available housing units when we don't know what our goal is, right? So then how do we come back and say, yes, we achieved you know, that 10% goal, or we've only achieved 5% of housing units, like how do we measure that success? And then how do we know when we're successful? So that's one, you know, very clear example. And, you know, the other one, I mean, there's, I have a whole list of them. I'm not going to go into it today. I mean, every, I have comments on every single line, but I think this is just an opportunity for us to collect that baseline. Like, um, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. I can, you know, improve the city's website. Well, what's wrong with the website? Like what's, you know, what is, how, do, what does improve mean? Like, how do we define that? Um, and how do we measure that success? Um, you know, improve recruitment for city committees. Like what is our city committee status now? Like what's the rate of, you know, um, participation and how do we measure recruitment for that like do we want a hundred percent for each committee like you know what i'm am i making sense right yeah i think those are all okay. valid points okay. i i've got a i've got a thought yeah. you know we we could easily find out how many vacancies we have on our city committees right. and we could look at well are we doing the right things to get people in those vacancies and if not what are, what should we be doing um with regard to the housing, it's a 
since it's a, something we've taken spent a lot of time talking about and we will continue to do that you know we've got uh we've got this project that we're doing on country club road and at the end of it we're going to have we're our hope is to have in the neighborhood of three to four hundred additional housing units up there and we don't know exactly how many years that's going to take but we can't say well how many housing units did we put there in 2024 and is that getting us to the goal because that's not what's going to get us to the goals what we know our plan is to do the uh <clears throat> do the growth center uh renewal and designation and and these other steps that we know are part of getting us to that goal and we can track whether we're doing those things in the way that we said we were going to do them. Kaylin, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, thank you. So uh, one of the things... Um... Could you try to be a little bit louder? Okay. Sorry, everybody's sleeping, so I'm trying to be... Okay. So how about now? Better? Yes, that is better. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I am okay to uh, approve all the goals, uh, but um, I don't feel comfortable at this point approving the initiatives and action items, because I mentioned this before. Um, I wanna see the budget, like projected budget for each um, initiative, because goals are kind of our vision, right? We wanna see those things happen to our city, uh, but initiatives and actions show that if they are real or not, if they are measurable or not. So maybe some of the things, we don't have any budget to succeed. That's why it is important for me to see some um, projected budget uh, for each, um, let me say goal, like a generally but basically initiatives and actions. And I know we will be still working on this plan, so I'm very happy that it's like 2024, 2027 strategic plan, so it's a three-year plan. Um, but I just want to um, mention this again. Thank you. Well, you say we're going to continue to work on this plan. The hope was that we would adopt the whole thing tonight. Well, Carrie. Uh, I I also would love to adopt the whole thing tonight. Um, we can we'll have lots of opportunities to make adjustments if we need to. Um, I don't. I think that the. I think it's already errs on the side of too much detail. Um, I would prefer a strategic plan that was sort of broader in scope and then left it up to the staff to decide how to implement everything. So um, I feel like they've given us a ton of detail. I feel very well informed. I feel comfortable approving this the way that it is. And so I move that we accept the strategic plan at, with the changes that Lauren and Tim suggested. Is there a second? Oh, second. Mm -hmm. Seconded by Lauren. Okay. Helen, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Um, I just want to make it clear that I said we will work on this plan because Kelly mentioned that. Again, you could, if, if you could move that closer, you. Uh, okay. So thanks. I said, I just want to make it clear. I said we will work on this plan because Kelly mentioned that every year we will see. So I'm not saying that oh, let's not approve it tonight and work all the details. Uh, but some of the details are important if we want to approve the strategic plan as a whole. That's why my hope is I say, yes, I'm approving the plan. I want to see the items I um, suggested uh, on the yearly um, 
what we call it, like a yearly working plan. Oh, thank you. That, that clarification. Yeah, is thank helpful. you. Thanks, mm -hmm. Pela. Uh, Tim and then Lauren. Janet, if you guys are clarifications and changes, I might to propose. Great. Um, basically, I'm I, don't, I don't think anybody should feel sheepish about that. Well, we've been kind of listening and waiting yeah. through, and I assume we'll be discussing tonight. Uh -huh. Like with on right to voting, which is yep. fine. But um, yeah, we do have a motion on it on the table. I guess he's commenting on the motion. I just want to make sure he's yeah. doing it all mm -hmm. correctly, so we can discuss. Yeah, yeah, policy. yeah. So create more housing. The first thing we've got is a develop policy to reflect housing priorities. Guys, we've got zoning policy that directs our housing. We've got a city plan. It's a time at which we've got to look more for results here, less for process. And that's that's not a good action step to have the guide or we we don't need to develop more policy for housing. <laughs> so in all fairness, um, you know, that was there before you just recently that that was a, had been drafted before you finished the zoning process. Okay. So technically we could always check that as that'd be great to take done. it right out. Yeah. Or just yeah. done for this year. You know, we started this back last okay. fall and you've since done the zoning. Yep. So so have you completed the FEMA damage inventory list? It seems like we must be there with that. So that's inventory list. Okay. However, <laughs> the projects on that list are not complete. No, but it's, this says create the list. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. We could take out those that are already done as a yeah. list. Um, on page six under initiative one point two point eight, develop and implement snow melt systems. It's been on a few, but we really haven't talked about it. Hmm. If we really want to be a green Excuse community me, with Tim. net zero goals, I'm struggling with this one. <laughs> um, really? Yeah. Well, that's trying to get us there. Well, and one way of looking at it, but using district heat to melt snow is not a cheap way to do it or environmentally that green. Uh, well, it, it, again, it's just a conversation we haven't had. We've heard it in presentations, and I'm not comfortable with it at this point. So I don't know how you guys feel. But... As opposed to you. Yeah, Tim, um, on... Tim, before you move it on, yeah. Uh, Bill had a question for you. Well, he, I go ahead. Re, Bill has had a response and maybe a question. Yeah, I think so. Again, this kind of goes to I mean, we wouldn't do a snowmelt system without the council's approval, right? So there's going to be a discussion about it. I think the question is is this something we can actively, you know, have on a future agenda for development? I mean, so it could be considered development of a snowmelt system. Uh, rather than do it, you know, develop, this does is a little bit more of a definitive statement. I don't want people to look at this and say, yeah, you guys said, let's do it. Right. <laughs> you know, because I, right. The, the other environmental be benefits are the treatment of the runoff thing. You know, it yeah. gets clean before it goes in the river. So there's that too, and less driving. But yeah, I hear your point. So, so Tim, would you live with uh, evaluate and consider a snowmelt sure. program? Okay. Um, the other one that's kind of in that category for me, almost there, guys, is the um, on page seven under projects. We still got projects underway. We still list Confluence Park, and I, it just seems like so much has changed since the flood, with issues we're having with you know just police responses and emergency issues down on the bike path. It it's just not a realistic project, and keeping it in as if it is. Feels like a disservice. And certainly, people are out raising money, trying to do things for it. And is this really a project we would even consider moving forward with at this point? I kind of, yeah. I kind of agree. Although the last time we voted on this, we voted to extend, extend it for eighteen months. I don't even know when that's up. It's, but... it's up this. I have it written down. It's like J July or August. Is this, oh, is really? This, is this like summer? Next month or the yeah, month? very okay. soon. It's coming up, yeah. So as it is now, the ad policy adopted by the council is to give the uh, proponents of the uh, plan time to raise the money to complete the work without any additional city funding. Um, and so again, this might be one of those things where it shouldn't be developed confluence, confluence park. It, it maybe should be uh, make a decision about confluence park. Now, I don't think we should be making that decision today by just changing okay. the strategic plan. Make but... a decision is far better than having it on an active project list. 
work for people? Yeah, and I'm just going to say, you know, just for explanation, it's it's on the list because it, it, you know, as it stands today, it is an active project that the council's approved and had a plan for, and gave a deadline for funding. I mean, we've sent support letters for it because it was council policy. So I mean, it's just just. You know, I don't know where they are with their funding, but I think they're pretty close. So, but so much has changed. I, I think we can't ignore that. Right. But I'm just saying, this isn't us trying to force a project. This is on here because it was an unadopted project that, just like all the rest of these, and actually, like Grunt Road Bridge is almost done. And the council can yeah. change that, but but this is where we are. So, Tim, I think you were in the yeah. middle of a list of other items that you were going to bring up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some of them are just duplicates. Like pursue snail melt option again is under pursue environmental improvement projects. Um, and then the other one was just the last one for me was um, oh, there's a couple uh, evaluate swift water rescue. Again, it's been on the list a few times, but I don't think we've ever talked about it. So that has to do with that is has to do with more of a capacity issue with our emergency services for people that are right. in the river that need swift water rescuing and flooding. We've had a couple of cases where we've had to pull people out and it was dangerous for our responders. And not it's not the reason we hired him, but uh, actually our new fire chief is kind of, that's one of his levels of expertise. So we hopefully we can have him look at, evaluate that for us. So Yeah. So that was more of an internal thing, but it's definitely a need that, and, and you know, could need resources at some point. My last nitly things are um, using uh, abbreviations and not saying the words. So like initiative 5.2.3, also on page 11 of 12, it says ICS training for staff. What is ICS training? Incident command system. So it should be spelled out. Yeah. And also down under um, 551, a little lower on that page under address mental health and addiction issues, it says continue CIT training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are my notes. Anybody else? Sorry. Um, so, I mean, I feel like the kind of high level priorities we're focusing on, like, I'm not hearing concerns about those. Like, part of what I like about being able to do a multi year plan, to me, that means we could continue to work on refining. Are there specific targets? Like I love setting some like 400 housing units in four years or something like, but I think we could adopt this tonight. We can, you know, it's, it feels like it's all on the right track and we could build on it to add better clarity. And maybe that's what like next year's strategic plan is because we have this as adopted. Maybe some work could be done. We've got some strategic planning experts who could help like, and we could, you know, build them out as more smart goals, but we don't have to start from scratch with a blank slate, um, like we've done in the past, which then just takes so time, so much time. It's hard to then get to, um, in the kind of format that we have and so much limited time with so many other competing agenda items constantly. So to me, I'm comfortable with this. Um, and I think it's something that we could build on and improve upon and like to Palin's point, build in budget, for the next iteration and stuff. I think those are all great ideas. And so hopefully if we have this to start from, we could we can adopt it and we could just kind of improve upon it as we go to like have more crisp goals, outcomes, deliverables and all that good stuff. So anyway, I'll, I'll be voting in support tonight and look forward to ongoing <laughs> I'm seeing I'm seeing some nodding heads. Are we, uh, is this ready to go to a vote? Keeping in mind that Lauren's motion was to approve it with the with the changes that uh, we've made, and I interpret that motion to include the changes that were suggested and accepted subsequent to the basic making of the motion. Al's motion, but did we move Carrie's motion? Carrie's motion. Carrie, okay, Carrie's motion. Carrie, are you good? Okay, Carrie. Uh, uh, I say something. I think so. Um, I, 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 Tim had additional suggestions, but I am. So I I would just love to hear them run off really quickly again. He made suggestions since I made the motion. 
Okay. Um, do you do you have could you go I've got do them very quickly? Some modifications. Okay, so the first one was um, on the goals, which we talked about, which just they're removing um, the unhoused after yep. the hall. And then under um, create more housing, item A, we effectively have already done through the zoning change, so remove that, which is develop policy to reflect housing priorities. Carrie, are you hearing? Uh... Yeah. Are you loud enough? Okay. okay. Um, I just noticed you're far back from the mic, so I'll get closer. Thanks, Tim. Um, you um, have to change from develop and implement snow melt systems on page six of twelve, item one point two point eight. I think instead of develop and implement snow melt systems, it was evaluate and consider. Evaluate and consider. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Consider and decide what to do with Confluence confluence park, something like that. Yes. Okay. Really. Some some jargon issues, initialisms and acronyms. Right. Yeah. Basically wherever you see them throughout, just fill yep. them in. Okay. Sounds great to me. Okay. Are we ready to vote? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you, folks. We've adopted our strategic plan. All right. Um, 1021? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do we have time to take up the revised communication plan? Come on up. Evelyn Prim, Communications Coordinator. Um, yeah, this should be really quick because I do not have a fancy uh, presentation. I just basically wanted to... I thought that was your job. That's what you do. <laughs> the one time that I don't. Uh, but no, I basically just wanted to introduce you all to this document and just give you some time to read through it, absorb it. And um, I'm here to answer questions if you have tonight. But um, mainly, it, uh, like I, I briefly said um, the last time we were here, it's mainly a staff document. Um, but it's in the format that again, anybody could look at it is my my goal anyway, is that anybody could look at it, look at that and then have a general understanding of what my position um, is about and the things that I do on the day to day. But again, also thinking about the long term vision of why am I even here in the first place? And that really um, was was birthed um, from from you all from the the 2022-23 strategic plan, um, the responsible and engaged government um, goal. So that was really pivotal in how I put this together. And then through uh, consultation with our crisis communication response team and the city manager's office that we've honed this to a, a, a presentable document. It is far from complete. I will say there are, every not a day goes by where I don't encounter something that is like, that should be in this, in the plan, I gotta put that in the plan. Um, so it will continue to evolve, I'll continue to add to it, but I'll also keep um, the most published or the most current uh, version up on the communications page on the on the website as well for, for anybody to review, so. Thank you, I think it's great to have this. I uh, I noticed a bunch of things, uh, like some things I would add to the, on page 17, um, the things I would add to the, predictable month and week and day uh, <clears throat> observations. So I'll, I'll just get with you about those. Please do. Yeah. And that's, that's also, I, I think a great opportunity too, is um, anything that you see that you all see that you'd like to be included, like, please let me know. I want this to be a document that works for all of us, not, not just me, but especially as, as the vehicle to um, uh, achieve the goals that we, that we want. So yeah, all ears. And one of the reasons, one of the things that prompted us, well, other than the fact that it's a good thing to do in general, but knowing that we did make some fundamental changes coming up, you know, basically the bridge page and to a lesser extent, the Times Argus page that have been really kind of bedrocks of our communications. Um, it was sort of how, what are we, you know, got thinking, what are we going to do to replace that or how are we going to supplement what, what is a newer plan? And so we felt like we should be informed and kind of how, what, what our thoughts are. Mm -hmm. 
anybody else have anything to say before we let everyone go sit down? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is uh, item 16, public record inspection, copying, and transmission policy. And so this had been uh, on an earlier agenda. The council had approved that on the consent agenda. And at the last meeting, council member Heaney asked that it be placed on an upcoming agenda for discussion. Turn it over to you. I think it was mostly about, because um, we did it on the consent agenda and we changed rates and fees. Um, and I think it's important for people to know what's involved in terms of getting public information. Um, and just thought we should at least acknowledge it and discuss the fees publicly versus, I guess I wish it had, I hadn't left it on the consent agenda and taken it off at that time. So really just throwing it out. I don't have any sense of just, um, it's really pretty far reaching because it deals with a lot of different kinds of information. General, Increases really just reflect staff time and effort to generate information. Yeah, I mean, we get a lot of public records requests, and I think one of the reasons the police chief stayed is that they get really the bulk of them. Um, and most of them are quickly handled within half an hour or so, and there's no fee. Um, but there are some that are very extensive and require additional time, uh, depending on what's involved. And uh, we've had some cases, uh, not referring to Stephen, because I know he asked a lot, but we have had some folks, uh, I think generally maybe even out of state that have been putting in very, a lot of requests and have figured out that if they send them a single requests, then, you know, they'd send in 20 or 30 individual requests at one time, all asking for the same type of information, but each each individual request would be under 30 minutes, but together they'd be a three to four hour piece of work. And so we were trying to address that. Chief, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So it was really just trying to revise those fees and, and also to uh, reflect the actual cost because. Yeah, sure. Eric Nordenson from the police department. Um, yeah, one of the things we did was review what the rates were in the communities around us. You know, I think anytime we're in a budget shortfalls, we start to look at opportunities, listening to you folks, hey, find the opportunities. Uh, so what I did is I looked at the state police, which was right around us. I looked at Berry City, and I also looked at a small town, Brandon. Um, they have a progressive police chief that I used to work with, right. and all the rates were the same. And I said, well, we're missing the boat on this. So I uh, started to make some phone calls to get the whys, and um, we decided to match the rates of those those areas of what they charge. The amount of staff time is significant for those. Uh, I, I think I'm at 95 public records requests this year, which uh, I'll do 110 to 125 a year. Um, so yeah, it's a significant amount of time. My admin, I share, which you know, I share with the fire department um, and that her primary responsibility is ambulance billing. So it, it's on Kevin and I. So um, there's a lot of time that's involved. So. Um, I'm curious the, we have uh, photos and videos audio recordings those are all going to be expensive I can understand why those are going to be expensive $20 for police report uh, that's that seems like that would just be finding a piece of paper and making a copy of it. Is there more to it than that? At times there could be redactions. There's could be digging. I could have to go downstairs to the hard files. You just never know what it is and what it entails. And then, you know, you might have a case with 16 different attachments and then you got to download 16 attachments and print them and scan them and uh, get them to the, the person in the way that they, they like them. 
uh, you know, sure, there's some easy ones. You know, one area that that I think we really focused on, though, is like victims of crime. So if you are a victim of crime, I'm not making you do any fees. You're going to get your records that you need. You know, like these are for records. You know, you know, we have neighborhood feuds where they want to know the records for the last two years of their neighbor because they're not getting along. And it takes me three and a half hours. And, you know, it's OK. You know, and I, I can't ask why. You know, I just provide the records. Um, but at the end of the day, it's three and a half hours of stuff. You'd probably rather have me do something more productive than just that. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we got, you know, we're on YouTube now. Somebody's going to the, the beauty of everything that I'm posting on our, on our pages and social media, they go right through our arrest logs from, you know, January of 2023 and they request every single record from every arrest one at a time. And that's within the 30 minutes. And next thing I know on a Sunday night, I get 25 public records requests. So I said, I know what I'm doing on Monday, you know? And so then Monday becomes Tuesday when I can actually do my job. So uh, it, it's, it's a lot. So mm -hmm. once we instituted this policy that slowed down those ones, um, I don't think it's had any impact on other public records for people that need them. So. Palin. Okay, thank you. So uh, will there be any procedure for people who cannot afford uh, this fees if they can prove that they don't have any money to pay the city? I mean, we could look at case by case, but you know, typically that would be the ones that are the victims of the crime and we're not charging for crime victims for the case that, that involves that case. So if your car got got broken into or, or whatever, I'll give you that case. You know, you deserve that case. Um, so it, it, we keep it pretty simple. Um, it's, it gets a little challenging when you want the records for the last two years or three years or five years. And something that is just totally random. I can't ask you why. And I, I'd love to provide it for you, but it shouldn't take me four hours to get those records, uh, you know. You, okay. guys, you guys pay me a lot of money. I mean, <laughs> if you want me to do that, I, I, I can. Or, you know, between that and the unfunded, you know, expungements that we have, our administrative lift is incredible right now. Between my detective doing expungements with with uh, my, uh, my uh, dispatch supervisor, you know, discovery requests are a different dispatcher and somebody else. You know, just it's literally pulling records, it seems like, all day, every day. And to expand... Um... Palin's uh, question just a little bit. Is there a general fee waiver provision in the policy? Well, so that's I, the thing. I didn't see any fee waivers in any other policies that I looked at. Okay. You know, but we've made the decision internally that if you're the victim of a crime, that's that's no problem. So, yeah. So if we were to look at it again, that's one thing we might want to consider. You know, we if there's going to be a waiver policy, you know, what what the criteria should be. Okay. Uh, th thanks, Chief. Uh, you might when you stay up for just a minute, Steve. Sure. I think you have a comment or question. I do, Steve Whitaker. Um, I question. I know it's from. It was in there at a prior version when this was adopted. A number of people in the community watched the way the council adopted this uh, and called it the Whitaker uh, policy because it was meant to throw a impediment against records requests. Uh, Two dollars a minute. I don't know how many people in city government make one hundred twenty dollars an hour, um, but. Uh, that should be a, a, a red flag. Uh, the fact that the city manager doesn't even know whether there's a waiver provision in there uh, should be a red flag of how uncooked this thing is. Um, it was represented on May 22nd when this was on the consent agenda that this is consistent with state police records. Uh, the state police uh have not charged for several voluminous records requests regarding a uh, a, hom a homicide two two homicides the Mark Johnson killing by Montpelier police out on the Spring Street Bridge it took them a year to get them all processed redacted etc but 
I was never sent a bill for that. Um, so, but, and I also put in a request recently where my vehicle was vandalized and I was told pay up the fees first. You know, I, I wanted the video and the recordings of the dispatch because the detective again came and lied about whether I said a witness was present. And so a lot of this, we don't have a police accountability board. We don't have a police review commission. And the scope of the police review commission that happened a couple of years ago was intentionally narrowed to not look back, but only look forward. Uh, Lauren and I think yourself could attest to that. So the, when accountability is the purpose, when people are harassed just for sitting in their car in the Haney lot, you know, and I ask for videos. Now it's going to be 2040. And when the press asks for videos or audio, it's going to be 20, 40, 60, 80 dollars. And that creates a real impediment to accessing records that are necessary to figure out what really happened. You know, the I'm better at, at processing and understanding what these records mean. I asked for CAD files re re related to a recently deceased person who is also one of four victims that's been assaulted by the same person here in town. And it's like, oh, that's going to be $20 per incident for, what was it, 20 different reports, Chief, you told me? So that's $400. It's going to cost me to basically piece together how this violent, you know, menace in our in our community uh, is, is being handled from a person who recently died while this had not yet been adjudicated. So I don't think that this is anywhere near baked. I don't think the press or the public has had opportunity to understand the implications, uh, both on their own requests for records. This is the first I've heard about the waiver for crime victims, but I often assist others in asking for records because I know how to do it and they don't, but I'm not the victim, so I'm not gonna get the waiver. So. Okay. This is this is complicated. I I ask that it be revoted uh, or reconsidered uh, because this thing needs a lot more work and it needs to be probably handled similar in a manner you would an ordinance by holding by publishing it, it put understanding have some analysis of the implications. The press would be very willing to do this because they are impacted by this. They're reporting is impacted by this, is fully dependent on this. And this is putting a paywall between accountability and transparency. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, what I would say is that when I've been present uh, for the development of this policy and when it was being discussed, what I'm mainly hearing is that there are these commercial entities that are contacting the Montpelier Police Department and probably police departments all around the country saying, give me, give us your video so we can put it on YouTube, essentially. And, and that's what's causing a lot, driving a lot of, uh, a lot of the burdens that we're seeing here. And so there's a cost to that. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Any other members of the council? I'll just say I can't speak for every request because I don't see them. I mean, I see all the requests, but I don't see all the how they're all handled. But I know that we typically, at least certainly the manager's office, errs on the side of not charging people. It's only if something's excessive. I don't believe I've ever asked you for anything money. Um, and, uh, you know, there, I get it. We certainly want information to be available to people. That's why first half hour is free for people. And I think we, we push that, um, the stat, the statute allows for charging to, to understand. So it can't be, you know, sort of take over someone's, th there's a reason, right? There is time involved there. Are, uh, and in frankly, the in most cases, the digital format does make it faster. You know, I think initially when this came in, it was literally photocopying or making, you know, printed documents. Now it is certainly a lot easier to email a document to somebody, but it still means finding it. It still means looking. It still means doing a search. And 
in extensive searches, that means for us, it's, uh, we, you know, we have to go, we go to our vendor and have them do keyword searches. And sometimes it's hit or miss. So then we have to do another one if we don't get the right ones. And th that's, that charges. I mean, we don't charge their costs. We just charge as per this. So, um, I mean, it is, it's a fine line. I get it. You know, certainly we'd love to just be able to give it all away free, but then, uh, that's all we'd be doing. And, uh, okay. So we had this on for discussion. Um, I don't think we're taking any action on this tonight. Um, some member of the council tonight or in the future can say, let's put it on the agenda to consider a, a amending the policy. I don't know if that's, if anyone wants to do that now, but it's certainly open to do Tim. No, actually, I was say, I, I'm glad we discussed it. Um, listening to the chief and, and thinking it through, looking at some of these things, um, and I know what it takes to look up videos and search it out and find the right piece. Um, it takes time. And I think that's one of the things I was most surprised at when I started on council was how many requests and how much staff time goes, you kept hearing about them going into these pieces. So, um, you know, that's not the primary work of our, our local government. It's a piece we do, but it's it just amazing how much time it takes for our staff. And um, my initial reaction is having heard what I've heard tonight, I'm satisfied with this. So. Okay, thanks. I think we can move on. Um, thank you. To Thanks, Chief. Move on to, um, I don't think we have anything for other business, which gets us to council reports. Down to Adrian tonight. Uh, I will just reiterate, I sent an email around that um, we have an exciting opportunity in Montpelier that the U.S. Virgin Islands soccer team is coming to Montpelier. Um, and they are going to be staying in Montpelier and they'll be playing at the College Green on July 11th at 6 p.m. organized by Emmanuel Williams, who is our local PE teacher. And so I think this is a great opportunity for um, hopefully re replicating additional recreation opportunities in our town to draw outside um, tourists. And so I hope that you all um, are able to attend that event. And um, maybe we, we talked about something special to welcome the soccer team. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with everyone and encourage you to participate. Thanks. Carrie? Uh, no report tonight. So? Um the point in time report uh, just came out and uh, I, I've got a copy of it or a link I can send to people. Um, it's a report that's done once a year on the homeless uh, population. And there are specific, there are a lot of specific numbers that I think will be eye opening to members of the council. Um, it's a problem that's not going away. It's just getting bigger. And um, we can't solve it ourselves, but I think we need to, uh, the people who can solve it for for help. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll send it out to folks and, and we can decide, you know, where we go from there. Thanks, Tim. Um, just for people to think about for the future, I, and I've talked to, I, I think as we get to 20 something agenda items and we keep doing this and every time we get through an agenda and it's like, so I remember when I said, I made the comment about, you know, you waste another perfectly good four hours and I don't know what I just accomplished kind of thing. It was like the old car talk line, but, um, but it, it does feel like we've got so much on our agendas and it, it, it's hard to feel like when we're done, we've accomplished a lot. I think it's, it's just, you know, it's a mile wide and inch deep kind of thing. And, and maybe we need to look at a format where we have to distill out items that maybe we just can't talk about everything um, and get down to key items that we need to be discussing and, and, and make some real progress on our key goals and issues. So um, kind of looking at kind of the way we jumped through tonight, it, it's like, wow. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, yeah, just to think about maybe how we can format our future to be more productive and, and, and have agendas that we can really do justice to. Um, and then the, then the other thing on the happy note is July 3rd is really soon. And are we in the parade? Yes. Okay. We're in the parade. All right. I don't know where we are exactly, but yeah. Um, Palin? No report for tonight. Lauren? Pass tonight. Thanks. 
Okay. The mayor's report, I just have a couple of items. <laughs> One is that uh, last week I had an opportunity with uh, some of our council members and our uh, other legislative delegation to meet with the representatives of the Vermont, the Vermont Afghan Alliance to talk about um, the uh, <clears throat> experience of Afghan refugees who've moved to Montpelier. And I think it's really a great credit to, uh, to the volunteers who have spent so much time uh, working with uh, people who, who needed the support to come here and um, members of the community who laid out a lot of money to help provide for housing and uh, and I think it's a great thing. As, as I said said the other night, um, we're talking about uh, the Afghan refugees as new Americans. And the United States is probably the only country in, in the world where you can say that someone moves to the country, decides to make this their home, and they're Americans. You, know, you can move to France, live in France for 50 years, you will never be French. You can move to Japan, live the rest of your life in Japan, you will never be Japanese. But you can move here and be an American. So, and the number of Afghan members of our community is uh, is striking how many people are here. We heard there are 40 to 50 Afghan students in our public schools. 5% uh, of the uh, of the kindergarten class next year is going to be Afghan students. So their families are here. They're making their homes here. And also, July 3rd is coming up. It's a great event. We're going to be in the parade, and I encourage everybody to get out, get to the uh, the the food stands and the listen to the bands and watch the fireworks. Um, look to see everybody out there, and that's what I've got. City clerk's report. <laughs> Early voting has begun for the August thirteenth primary, so everything you need should be on the clerk's page of the website. It looks at. Um, sample ballots, registering to vote links, requesting an early ballot link, the warning should all be there. So yeah, check it out. That's it for you. Um, so with regard to the primary, are you looking for volunteers or are we all covered already? Oh yeah, no, I'll need volunteers. I'm getting out a link um, to start the, you know, looking around in the community, but members of the BCA, yeah, to the extent you can help. That's that would be tremendous. Great. City manager's report. Okay, I know it's late, but I do have a few things. So hang tight. Uh, first thing with regard to the unhoused population, we are working at putting together uh, an agenda item uh, at the next meeting, July 17, to sort of have our different departments report on their experiences and the extent of what we're seeing maybe get some external folks in here that are, are issuing to to try to just update you on what we're seeing and in, in those kind of efforts. So that is in the works. I hope we can pull that off. Um, so that's coming up. Um, do have a couple of meetings with state folks that uh, just to refer, I am meeting with uh, folks about emergency shelter uh, this week, uh, specifically about in, potentially investing more funds into our Elks Club to put in uh, things that have been mentioned, showers, more space, make it, you know, last year was an emergency basis to make it a better facility. Uh, and I think there's some state money for that. So we have we have a meeting coming up with that. Also a different meeting, uh, this will be after the holiday week, but um, kindly the state has put together a group of people, uh, of key officials from different agencies that all could potentially be involved in funding or doing things as was with regard to our um, country club road project. So we've got a, a meeting with a whole group of people, Mike and Josh and I, 
Uh, so that's coming up. Uh, so that should be interesting. Uh, and similarly, uh, the mayor and I have uh, starting our tour, our meetings with uh, key employers. We've already met with Vermont Mutual. We've got National Life and Union Mutual coming up. I think I've got a meeting with the hospital. So we're talking to them in general about building relations, but also suggesting that they there may be a housing project they might want to get involved in if they if that's an issue. So um, that's good. So speaking of housing, I'll jump in and say that oh, at Vermont Mutual, they're coming up on their 200th anniversary, founded in this city, been here for that uh, for the whole time, and they, it's clear that they're committed to being here. Yeah, yeah. You know, they've had you know a couple of bad floods, and they're, but they're they're rebuilding. So, so speaking of the housing project, however, uh, we're still we're still looking at this a little bit, but I do want to uh, we have some. Pretty serious concerns with the Act 250 bill that passed um, as we as we unpack it. Uh, on the plus side, it made housing in growth centers, um, you know, basically exempt from Act 250. The downside is that is not until uh, January 1, 2026. And I think more importantly, it kind of freezes the growth centers the way they are now. So our goal of expanding our growth center to include this may be shut out, which means we then have to go through an entirely different process to get TIF, which you can't do until you become designated as a tier one area, which you can't do until 2026. Uh, so the basically the goal to jumpstart housing, just put it all off for two years. So well done there. Um, so it's, we're trying to learn more, but it, it, and it's going to come up at my meeting with the state officials about the funding. Like, what else are you going to do here, folks? Because you didn't you didn't help. Um, so big problems there. As far as and, and as I said, we're still digging on this. So maybe we'll someone will convince us that we're wrong. I hope we are. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up is, uh, and this is the item I mentioned earlier that we might ask to be on one of the special meetings, and it's it's a it's a it's a tricky issue. So you may recall a couple of years ago, we adopted, uh, the city council adopted a responsible contractor ordinance, which some of you may not even realize that we have this, but it requires any of our contracts that are above $250,000 to pay, uh, to certify that they're paying all their employees on their job at the Vermont prevailing wage rate, not the Davis-Bacon wage rates, not what's considered livable, but the Vermont prevailing wage. And because of flood, because of COVID, we haven't had a lot of big projects, but now we have some money and we're starting to move forward with these things. And uh, so just on School Street, uh, our costs, the, the, the upcharge, we asked specifically how much of, first of all, the bids came in over budget, the, the bid, the only bid. And then we asked how much of that was due to this provision and it was at 30%. So um, while I certainly think it's great policy to want to treat workers fairly, um, I think it's also, you know, that, and, and we're concerned about this with the paving bids. So, you know, if it's 30% more going to the contractors for this work, then that's 30% less work that we can get done with that same money. So um, that's our concern. Uh, you know, I heard, conversation during the break that not all of school street was going to be done that is a, that's an incorrect statement all of it is in the bid the prices are over and we are trying to renegotiate those or uh, get them down and or seek other ways to put funding together it's a top priority to do all of it uh, and that the culvert will be done separately from the main bid um, so that is all still but that is the one that makes them so we would the question is would you consider obviously you have to make that decision tonight would you consider having an item to discuss whether we would basically put a temporary hold on this ordinance kind of like we did with the the um parklet ordinance a few years back basically because all our flood recovery work is going to get hit with this uh, and so would we you know basically at least through this construction season with the idea that we'd revisit the full policy in the fall and the reason it's of some urgency is that we're trying to get these contracts signed and these bids for this summer's work so if we could do that on either the 
July one or July nine meetings. Uh, and I know that's more than a five minute meeting, but even if we get to July 17, you know, time's ticking and projects are getting done. So I hate to spring this on you. It really just came to my attention this afternoon. It's too late to add to this agenda. And would, you know, I think there should be some public warning of this. We shouldn't just adopt this at, you know, this time of night. So right yeah it's, um it, yeah it's an ordinance also to the ordinance carried so i i just want to clarify is is that the the issue is the that it would be too expensive to stick with this or that we can't actually the issue is that it's expensive and and um and we are in a bidding climate where there's already a whole bunch of work out there for people um, because there's a lot of money. You know, we're not the only people that have federal money for projects. And uh, certainly even in our area, there's a lot of competition, you know, for smaller work, just for, you know, flood repairs, those kind of things. There's a lot of, a lot of competition for work. So the feedback we're getting is if something makes it more of a hassle to, to do the job, there's just other work. So why deal with it? Um, but specifically the indication, and we, you know, I would want to do a total scrub before a real meeting to make sure of this, but that we were told by the contractor that it was an additional 30% of the bid to meet these wages. And these are, you know, I think even if we were to go to Davis Bacon wages, there still would be more than general bidding, but at least that's something contractors, many of them are used to using. We, we actually set a, a different rate, uh, the, this Vermont prevailing wage rate. So uh, we can do it. It will cost us more. It will mean that the people working on the job, you know, get paid better. Uh, so it's a, it's a really a, a policy question, and um, and you know, the council did wrestle with this a few years ago and did opt to adopt this. And it's not a policy; it's an ordinance. So it's not like you can just change it. It's actually would require at least one public hearing. Our, our the law and our charter really only requires one public hearing usually do two by tradition, but we could amend it with one, at least for this provision. So I'm throwing it out there. Um, and I think the real question is, again, not ask you to decide what you will or will do, but would you consider taking it up at one of these special? So I think I saw your hand up. Well, all right. I was just curious how we, how we verify compliance or have we never had to do it? We haven't really had to do it to this extent. So we get basically, it gets a written certification from the contractor. You know, if it's Davis Bacon, there's a whole payroll audit system. And we don't, yeah, we don't do that. We don't do that with this, for this. There's a reason Davis Bacon does that. Exactly. <laughs> no, I know, I, I get it. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, I I mean, I, I know you said you'd scrub the numbers. Like it just, it seems shocking to me that they're really paying 30% less in this labor market than the prevailing wage in Vermont. So like, I just find that hard to believe. So maybe this is a negotiating piece, like go back and be like, did you inflate it by 30% because of this like policy, but you're not, there's no way they're paying 30% under. I, I just, it seems hard to believe. Like maybe, maybe that's true, but it just, I would want more information before I would want to move away from a policy we adopted to, give people a livable wage. Uh, Carrie? Um, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I I can't believe that they're paying 30% below. Um, so yeah, I think that it is worth continuing that conversation. I also think that, I mean, we didn't, we didn't adopt this ordinance because we were trying to save money. We adopted it because we were trying to make sure people get paid fairly and decently, and that's going to cost more money. And so that's what we took on when we passed this ordinance. I think it's a good one. I I would like to stand by it. Um, so are people open to putting it on an agenda for one of these upcoming meetings? Or do we want to just say the ordinance is what it is? Or how about we put it on for an agenda 
and we'll we'll get more information and then we'll decide if we even want to put it on a on an agenda for some kind of reconsideration. Is that clear enough? I'm seeing I'm seeing people nod. So I just want to make sure I understood that correctly. So you want you want to have a discussion about whether to then put it on for re, for a potential suspension for the season. Yeah, you wouldn't want us to just put it on for that and then decide you don't want to do it. Just well, that's what I'm I'm trying to feel out what people want to say. I'm I'm thinking it's going to take some lead up to it because the majority of the council weren't even on the council when we adopted it. It's going to take some. Filling it, fill, filling people in on what it's all about, and there's some factual issues that I'm hearing some skepticism yeah, about. I understand that. But there's also some urgency, right? I mean, you're getting yeah, that's the, you're that's getting the flip side of it is that you know if we if we do the process for too long, it won't matter for the season's mm -hmm. contracts. So. Let's. See if we can put it on for the first for a preliminary discussion. And then maybe the eighth, the ninth, or whatever. Yeah. If people are open to considering it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, folks. 11 p.m. on the dot, and we are adjourned. <laughs>